I'm very interested in this stuff. And it's really for that reason alone that I wanted to talk to you because I just, I mean, you're kind of the person who introduced me more than any other single person to this whole realm of civilizational analysis. You and maybe Camille Paglia, and you've just covered so many of the key thinkers. And so, you know, I want to try to synthesize all of these accounts and develop my own picture, right? Take what is valuable. And so I thought the best place to kind of start this exploration, at least semi-publicly, is with you because you're so incredibly well-versed in so many of the relevant thinkers. So as I said to you by email, the idea I had was first to ask you who, in your view, is on the short list, say, of the truly indispensable analysts of civilization. Start by making a list. And then we could go through each thinker and try to identify the core new and important things about civilizational development that each of these thinkers saw and maybe which key things they got wrong. And then as a next step, we could try to synthesize their accounts. You know, how can we put together Spingler, Toynbee, Quigley, Gebser, et cetera? You know, where do these analyses build on and supplement each other? Where do they simply disagree? And maybe we might even try where there are disagreements to adjudicate between the disagreements. But the idea in this in this step would really be to try to synthesize all of these accounts into a single overarching account. And then finally, this could be in this conversation or the next one, we could try to take this single overarching account and apply it to the present moment and the present place that we both inhabit, which is, you know, the US or the Western world. So yeah, maybe we could start just with your list. Who for you is on that list of truly indispensable? Um, for, for, so for me, everything starts with Oswald Spengler, as you know. Um, so that's, he's like the nucleus that, that I think of all these other guys, almost like electrons revolving around. He's the core and I still my favorite and I think the best. But then also, uh, you know, I found over the years that Toynbee, uh, was indispensable uh, in supplementing Spangler, uh, and I think they're they're quite a bit more compatible than either one of them ever would have thought. <laughs> I don't think I don't think Spangler would have given a rat's ass about Tony. You know, <laughs> probably wouldn't even uh, British empiricist. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. But we know that Tony read Spangler, and that that uh, that had a lot to do with getting him going uh, for him. And then we have uh, Gene Gebser was a Swiss uh, thinker, started as a Jungian, and then became a kind of Jungian, a rebel against Jung's whole worldview of conscious versus unconscious he thought was too simplistic, and that uh, the history of the human collective unconscious actually has strata, like geological strata. There, there are layers to it. So he has a very interesting uh, approach that I think is actually compatible with both of these guys. Mm-hmm. And then there's the American equivalent of these guys, which is uh, the closest to it is Carol Quigley, um, where Quigley basically takes a lot of Toynbee's ideas. I'm not sure that Quigley ever read Spengler, but he most certainly read Toynbee uh, because his stages, and he has seven of them that each civilization goes through, are almost identical to Toynbee's, who, who also has seven stages. Spengler has four. Gebser has, I think, five or six. And then, um, so there's also Joseph Campbell, um, who was the guy that started me on everything. Uh, with his four-phase model of history as, as a totality, um, he has four distinct stages for the history of mythology and religion uh, that, once again, I think is very compatible with these guys. And also there's a guy that I like uh, named Franz Borkenau, who's, who's incredibly obscure. <laughs> nobody's heard of him. Nobody's read him. Uh, and he doesn't have a magnum opus like these guys do. He has a series of essays. He, he studied Toynbee and Spengler. He was Austrian. He started out socialist uh, and then turned away from it later on and became more interested in the theory of culture. But he's got this wonderful idea about the history of death cults, de- death and burial cults. In one paper that he has in this incredible anthology that's really good, every, every paper in it is good, but this paper on uh, the sequence of, of the, uh, the the attitudes that these various civilizations have toward death uh, really matters. So there's that, and then... Uh, so, like, uh, my mentor was William Irwin Thompson, who was a guy uh, that is not that popular nowadays, but he was my mentor, and he, he's uh, one of these types of guys who has a, a model that's a little more consistent with what's going on today. Um, so these are the guys I, I would want to look at. Okay, fascinating. So I'm pretty familiar with a couple. I am somewhat 
albeit quite superficially familiar with all the others, except for William Irwin Thompson, who I know nothing about. I can't wait to go through these. So do you think there's a particular order? Should we maybe go in the order you, you presented them? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's do that order. Let's start okay. with Spengler. So Spengler's model is a four-stage model. He's got, um, uh, whereas Quigley and Toynbee, as we'll see, are both seven stages that each civilization goes through. Um, and the four-stage model is classic. It's there in Hesiod. Hesiod has four stages that history goes through, each one getting worse until you wind up with the, you know, you go from gold, silver, bronze to the Iron Age uh, that we're living in now. Hesiod says, you know, we're using this metal and we're degenerates by comparison with the, the giants who were the Mycenaeans. And so in a way, Spengler wants you to think of that, uh, the four stages of his model, where he has a pre-cultural stage, uh, an early cultural stage, a late cultural stage, and then finally his Iron Age is what he calls civilization. And so he makes a huge distinction here between culture and civilization in that for him, those are those are early, and every civilization goes through these four predetermined stages that are as predetermined as a biological life cycle is. Uh, any given organism, uh, other than bacteria, let's say, which don't have this life cycle, um, has a, a, a life cycle. You have a youth, you have a, a maturity, you have an old age, you have death. So he wants to plug it into that model. And so with the pre-cultural period, the pre-cultural period is mostly kind of disorganized. Uh, there's a lot of barbarian war bands and tribes. This would be in the Greek world, the Mycenaeans, uh, let's say, and their interaction with the Minoans. It's pre-cultural. It's not really Greece yet. Uh, it's nascent. It's on the way. Something new is happening, but it has not yet fully clarified itself and what its sort of world mission is. Then it, at some point it clicks. And in this case, this is after the uh, the disaster with the Greeks uh, that hit the Mediterranean around 1200, starting with the Trojan War, and then uh, the displacing of the sea peoples who come raiding in as the equivalent, let's say, of the Vikings for, for this period. They come raiding in. There's all this chaos and catastrophe, and then a dark age hits. The Mycenaeans had writing, but now it's gone, uh, down to about the time of Homer. Then when Homer comes in, now we're in the cultural period, and we're getting the articulation of the Homeric worldview uh, in the Iliad and the Odyssey with a whole new world horizon that is emerging here, that is very clear, coherent, and consistent. At the same time, the Olympic Games get up and running. Uh, they start figuring out what they're going to do politically. Um, everything starts sort of co cohering together in all these various disparate areas but yet it's the manifestation of a single worldview. And in Egypt, this, of course, occurs uh, in the fourth dynasty with the pyramids, where you get this, uh, a new religion comes into being with each of these cultures uh, that has a new way of burying the dead. And the religion is the thing that is the catalyst that lights the fire for the whole civilization over the next one, two, three thousand years, how, however long it takes. Uh, for Spengler, the ideal life cycle is a thousand years. Um, but then these civilizations, once they die, can, can go on like living mummies for, for a very, very long time, uh, as India and China, let's say, do to, to this day. Um, they're, they're still up and running, but they're long past the period of their metaphysical flowering. Those days are gone. Um, so then we have the so that's the early cultural period when we have the articulation of a religious world worldview. Um, we have kings and feudalism and so forth. Then the aristocracy comes into power politically at about the same time that the culture shifts to philosophy and metaphysics from religion as the motivating force. This is the late cultural period. And then so we get the, the Greek pre-Socratics coming in. They come on stage. And then the whole thing climaxes with Plato and Aristotle, in our case with the German idealists, uh, Hegel, Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Schopenhauer, all the great German idealists, uh, and especially Goethe. But a huge influence here on, on Spengler. This is really where he's taken his model from Goethe's theory of the metamorphosis of plants. This is almost a way of thinking of civilizations as these giant sort of superorganisms or plants. So the whole thing climaxes with these great metaphysical thinkers, and then it starts to decline into the from the culture period to the civilization period. Yeah. One quick question. How would Spengler make sense of the culture slash civilizations that didn't really have philosophy? Right, because it, we'll get to this because okay. this, this is an issue. <laughs> it's okay. an issue. Yeah, okay, and great. he realized that that there's a difference uh, between the first generation of civilization, Egypt and Mesopotamia, which did not have philosophy, and the second generation, which did. So, uh, and this is why I like Toynbee to to come in and shed light on this. The difference here: there are generations of these well, civilizations. And Gebser too, right? 
Um, yeah, and then Gebser as well. Exactly, it's yeah. very, com- very, very compatible. Okay. So let's finish Spanberg. Of course, of course. Which is to say that as we move into the tail end phases of these civilizations, um, metaphysics because becomes something that they're they're not really interested in anymore. They're interested in empire building. They're interested in the creation of what Toynbee calls a universal state. So the culture becomes, instead of intensive, it now becomes extensive geographically, and we get the formation of these universal states. Uh, this happens simultaneously in India and China, in India with Chin, uh, or in India with Ashoka, who conquers for the first time all of India, unifies the whole thing, creates an empire, then converts to Buddhism, uh, almost as an act of conscience, let's say. Uh, then 200 BC, this is going on. Same thing in China. Chin Shiwangdi comes in. Uh, and creates after China is named after him, uh, the, the Qin Empire. These are barbarian nomads who have come from the hinterlands who come in and conquer the whole thing and unify it. They dispense with the cults of filial piety, ancestor ancestor worship, and they just have a very dry, pragmatic philosophy called legalism. Um, and while that's going on, then of course the Romans are fighting the Punic Wars, uh, and at the same time uh, against the Carthaginians, uh, then Hannibal and the second. Um, and then they emerge victorious uh, as the masters of the Mediterranean, at, at, a bit like America after the World, World War II. Mm. Uh, they're in that position to now construct their universal state. So we get these end phases. And then in the Islamic world, the civilization phase is the Ottoman Empire, which comes in and creates a huge empire. Uh, and there really aren't any philosophers <laughs> in the Ottoman Empire. They're Turks. They're Seljuk Turks who have come in from the hinterlands, again, like the Qin in, in China, and they've conquered uh, this world. They have prag- pragmatists, doctors, engineers, lawyers, people like that. Um, the Arabic philosophers have passed. They've had their great floreazon with Al-Farabi and Avicenna. And, and they even had a Spangler, uh, 1300 AD, uh, the Mukaddima uh, by Ibn Khaldun, who's the first sort of guy to survey the history of all the different civilizations at that time, uh, 1300. So... Um, so the Ottomans come in, they're very pragmatic. So the Aztecs, let's say, you can see the analogies versus the Mayans, who were the great artists, the great metaphysicians. The Aztecs are just empire builders. Their art is nowhere near as good. It's a little bit like the difference between Rome and Greece or America versus Europe. So you can see a pattern here that's recurring in all of these civilizations. There is what Spangler called a morphology, a, a, a living form to these civilizations that is like analogous to the predetermined life cycle of, let's say a human being, we're only going to live 100 years. We don't have uh, a life cycle that, that's going to go much over that. It's 100 years. That's a predetermined life cycle. A thousand years for the, the culture period of these civilizations, whereas the universal state period uh, can, you know, could, could go on for a long time. And it's just a, like the Roman Empire did for, you know, four centuries before uh, its life was, you know, head was chopped off by the, the German barbarians. That's Spangler in a nutshell. That's a that's a very quick bird's eye view of Spangler. Okay. So one important thing to pull out of Spangler is that it's very deterministic. Yes. There is no avoiding these stages, right? They Correct. Simply, they that, simply come. Yeah. There's, no, there's nothing any individual can do about it. Whereas I think some of the more, like the Anglo-American civilizational analysts might demur slightly. And, and Toynbee and Quigley might argue that there isn't this kind of necessary se- sequence of steps. So anyway, I'm sure we'll get into that, but I just wanted to highlight that because I think that's a pretty key assertion, right? On Spengler's part, that not all of the civilizational yeah. analysts are going to agree with. That's right. And in fact, I don't think any of them do. Spengler's alone in that determinism. Um, the, the, he's bound to it, though, because he took the metaphor from biology. So he's right. kind of stuck with it. Uh, you either commit to that, that metaphor or you don't. Um, and so these other guys regarded, I think, as German mysticism, just typical German mysticism. We don't need that. We can look at civilization without that. Mm. And uh, so I think Toynbee is the first to do that. Although he can certainly adduce a lot, lot of evidence to support that claim. And I think a lot of people, even in the one civilization that, according to Spengler, was still alive, ours, Faustian civilization, yeah. I think a lot of people today feel that it is almost decrepit. So mm-hmm. it's not as if he doesn't have a lot of evidence, I think, to, to yeah. support this notion that there is a kind of necessary end to... Uh, I remember Northrop Fry's essay on Spengler, uh, the literary critic way back in the, what is it, 60s-ish, where he, he said, well, what matters about Spengler is not so much whether civilizations are living organisms, 
it's whether they behave enough like living organisms to justify the analogy. Uh, right. So that kind of that loosens it a bit. It makes it a little more, you know, you don't have to quite feel so stuck with it. Uh, yeah. yeah. They don't behave like organisms. Yeah, I mean, you know. my interpretation of Spingler was never that, uh, I never thought that he was saying civilizations are literally organisms. It was a metaphor. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. That's how I understand it as well. As well, yeah. it, it works better thinking of it that way. These are metaphors that enable us to understand these societies in ways that are not possible without postulating the metaphor. Uh, then that opens new doors. Uh, right. And then, yeah. So that's how I understand it. The, the last thing I'll say, and then we can move to Toynbee, is that I teach a lot of courses on political science, and whenever we talk about the economic development of countries or about the development of democracy in certain parts of the world, beginning in the West and then spreading to a number of other parts. There's this theory, modernization theory, that's very powerful and influential and arguably for good reason. But what's interesting about it is that it has certain qualities that remind me of Spingler in the sense that modernization theory is just this view that all nation states are subject to this inexorable process of modernization, wherein they go from being traditional to being modern. And that means going from being rural to urban, agrarian to industrial, religious and superstitious to scientific and rational, and so on and so forth. And to me, modernization theory, it's somewhat similar to just one part of Spingler's account. And it's funny because modernization theory in political science and in economics, modernization is generally viewed as a good thing. Whereas for Spingler, yes, it is inevitable that countries will modernize in the sense they will urbanize, they will become irreligious, they will industrialize, etc. But all of these things are, they have a they have a more negative quality in Spingler than they do in modernization theory. That's true. Yes, absolutely. Um, anyway, okay. So so why don't we go to Stoinby or Stoinby? I'm going to say that again. Uh, why don't we move to Toynbee? <laughs> um, Stoneby. <laughs> um, yeah. So the interesting thing about Toynbee then, so um, Spengler comes out of the German idealist metaphysical tradition, and then Toynbee comes out of the British empiricist philosophical. Uh, tradition. Uh, so they're kind of rehearsing this debate between the idealists and the empiricists. This has been going on in philosophy uh, since Descartes. And um, so time becomes in. And the interesting thing about him is that he says Spengler has too few civilizations. He's only got nine of them. Whereas what he sees is a whole bunch of what he calls societies. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, and it varies uh, with Toynbee depending on where you catch him. He's got the initial 12 volumes of a study of history that came out through the 1930s. Then later in the 1970s, near the end of his life, he revises it in a one volume version. Uh, but in either case, he's got, I think, in my opinion, too, too many societies. It's over 20, mm -hmm. 20 something. And the numbers vary. Um, but he does kind of have a point uh, that there are other types of societies that don't this Spangler's model in the light of Toynbee is like an ideal model. Mm. But with Toynbee, Toynbee comes in and says, what about the Hittites? These are, this is a society that doesn't quite fit this grand morphology. You know, they're, they're a little strange. And they only existed for uh, about 500 years, 1500 BC down to 1200 or, or thereabouts somewhere in there. There's some Neo-Hittites that come after the tragedy, the, the disaster that hits the Eastern uh, Mediterranean around 1200. They're Indo-Aryan, but they've imported Mesopotamian culture. So they're not exactly Mesopotamian. They're Indo-Aryan ethnically. They're a bit of a puzzle. And so he comes up with this idea, well, they're a satellite society. Mm -hmm. The Hittites are a satellite of the Mesopotamian civilization, which is really interesting. It's a, it's a very useful idea. And he says, well, the Minoans are another kind of anomaly. Of the, this society it isn't exactly Greek, and it's not exactly Egyptian. It's a satellite of Egypt. So... Um, we get these smaller scale societies that Toynbee takes into account as satellites of the of the behemoths, as the big ones. He accepts, I think, pretty much the nine civilizations of of, of Spengler, uh, but he adds all these other ones. And then he has this cool idea about there are these abortive civilizations. Like he says, the, the Polynesian civilization is abortive because they expended all their energy on conquering the Pacific Ocean and then and building the statues on Easter Island. And then they ran out of energy. It's, <laughs> it's, it's abortive. And uh, so he's got all these cool ideas that Spengler does not have. And then the key thing, though, that I think that is the most important thing from Toynbee is his idea that there are actually 
three distinct generations of high wow. civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first generation consists then of Mesopotamia, which is the Sumero, Akkadian, Babylonian civilization. The Babylonians there are the Romans, uh, and Egypt. That's the first civilization. Then there's a generation. Then there's a second generation, which comes in across the board then with China, India, Persia, uh, the Hebrews, and the Greeks. Uh, that's a different tenor to it. It's, it's philosophically inclined. Mm -hmm. This is a philosophically inclined generation of civilization. And then we get the third generation that comes in uh, with uh, Mahayana Buddhism in India and with uh, Islam uh, coming out of the Middle East and with ours, the far Western civilization, but and also Russia. Um, so there are three three distinct generations there. And I think Toynbee has nailed this um, because here's the, the crucial difference between the first two. The first generation, as, as you mentioned, does not have philosophy. They never had philosophy. They remain in a strictly religious worldview. It's always religion uh, with the Sumerians and with the Egyptians. They, they never attained the level of abstract thinking that the second generation brought in. But the thing about the birth of the second generation, something very decisive has happened during the millennium from 2000 BC to 1000 BC, and that is that the Indo-Aryan, Indo-European invasions have taken place across the board. They come in riding horses and two-wheeled chariots with compound bows, and they come in and they invade uh, these sort of ancient dying behemoths. You know, Egypt has been there already forever, and Mesopotamia forever. And they come in, they conquer these civilizations going across the board, and then there's a, a kind of a dark age silence for a bit. And then we get these new civilizations up and running, which have come into being out of a fusion of these invaders with the local populations. There has been a fusion of two different, what Deleuze and Guattari call sign regimes. There, there are two different sets of symbols now that have been conflated together to bring into being the second mightiest, I think, of all the civilizations uh, have, that have come into being with phil philosophically inclined mentalities. And just right when Spengler said philosophy should emerge in the early cultural period, that's when it happens across the board. We get the Upanishads coming into being as the birth of Indian philosophy out of a strictly religious worldview. Um, the creator of the Upanishads, Yajnavalkya, is a man who teaches yoga and philosophy and makes fun of the Brahmin priests. Uh, so he gets into conflicts with them. You don't need to do rituals. You don't need to sacrifice. All you need to do is practice yoga and meditation. And at the same time, we get in China, we get the, the hundred schools with Lao Tzu and Confucius and all these guys coming into being. In Greece, we're getting Pythagoras and Plato and, uh, you know, with the Hebrews who have a sort of combined religious and philosophical mentality. Um, all this stuff is up and running and the world shifts into a philosophical uh, mentality all across the board at about the same time, right? Uh, perfectly in line with Spengler's morphology when it does happen. Uh, so there we go. This would be the axial age, right? The axial age, yeah. As Carl Jaspers called it in his in his book. That's right. The axial age, which he, he gives the dates uh, from 500 BC. It's very narrow in his case. I, I would expand it a bit, but 500 BC to 200 BC, 500 BC, you get, you know, uh, Pythagoras, the Buddha, Lao Tzu going across the board. Um, and then 200 BC, as we have seen, all the empires then come into being with Ashoka and Qin Shi Huangdi and the Punic Wars uh, that end it. Uh, I would expand that, though, to more like 800 BC down to almost the year zero. I, I would I would just expand it because 800 BC is when, you know, Yijin of Alkia comes in uh, and we start getting philosophers coming in across the board. Uh, er earlier than Pythagoras and Plato and company. Is it worth talking about the second and third phases? Is there an interesting distinction there that's worth uh, focusing on? Or Yes, because, like yeah, there is. In the third phase, we get the creation of these universal religions, what's, what uh, Toynbee calls universal churches, hmm. Islam, Mahayana Buddhism, Western Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, and these religions are still with us to this day. Uh, they're very, very powerful. And this third generation uh, is more of a religious generation than a philosophical one. Um, so there is a distinction, even though we, of course, do have Russian philosophy and Western philosophy as well, and the Islamic Arabian philosophers too. But nonetheless, they are philosophizing within a religious worldview. Uh, and we have the creation of these massive universal churches, uh, which is what Twinby calls them. Um, so, yeah, it, it is different from, from the second generation. And maybe this is a good segue into Gepser, but 
there's something that's not very linear about that, right? To go from yeah. mythological slash religious to philosophical back to religious. Yep. Whereas Gepser's idea, I think, is more archaic, magical, mythical, mental, and then integrating all of them. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm probably getting this wrong, but it, kind of, it, it almost sounds like Toynbee is saying you're almost going back and forth between religious and mental rather than, in a sense, elevating and ultimately integrating. Right. So do you, do you think that that's a good se- segue into Gebser? Yeah, no, it's perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then Gene Gebser uh, is a philosopher who came out of Switzerland, um, and uh, he was teaching at Jung's place at, at Bullingen. Um, he was teaching Jung in psychology. Um, but it began to bother, bother him that, that Jung, uh, Jung's polarization between conscious versus unconscious just seemed too simplistic to him. And he thought that the history of human civilization has gone through these, uh, a series of stages of st- structural of consciousnesses, or what he calls consciousness structures, that have an internal consistency to each one of them. And you've just named all five of them perfectly. And um, they are, and he sees them, and this is a crucial thing for him, which he's also borrowed from biology, actually, is that they have emerged through mutations. These are spontaneous mutations of consciousness. Uh, the Germans were very fond of this idea of mutation theory, at which they thought that Darwin didn't really have or emphasize with natural selection and random mutations. For the Germans, mutations, uh, when they look at biology and they see a mutation coming into being, they don't see it as random. They see it as purposive and having a telos to it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, and it's, it's really interesting you say that because I've just been reading a little bit about contemporary cr- critiques of Darwinism. And actually, I mean, this is a major crit- critique of Darwinism to this day, that the mechanism of random mutation probably cannot explain how we got to where we are today in the short span of time that is allowed since life yep. has existed. Yeah. Uh, th- it's a temperamental difference between the Anglo empirical tradition and the, and the German. You know, it's, it's a temperamental difference. Um, the Germans like to see things in terms of organism, whereas the British like to see things in terms of mechanism. Um, but be that as it may, yeah. uh, so Gebser comes in and says, we have, so let's look back at human history here. We have this archaic structure of consciousness that we can't say much about because we don't have any writing from it. It's so old. It must go well back into the lower Paleolithic two million years ago. Let's take it back to Lucy, let's say. Uh, we don't know much about it. Uh, it's just the ground of origin of, of, of human consciousness. But we do know about the magical consciousness structure, which comes into being with the Paleolithic, with the Upper Paleolithic, and the birth of uh, art from the Cro-Magnon peoples who come in, fight with the Neanderthals, and I, I believe ethnically cleanse them out of existence. Um, that's a controversial theory. But uh, what is not controversial is that suddenly we have painting and sculpture 30,000 B.C., uh, right in there, thirty to thirty-five thousand. We get the first of the caves, Chauvet. But we get the the oldest sculptures, which come out of Eastern Europe, uh, whereas the painting comes out of Western Europe. And I tend to see that as actually two different cultures in the Paleolithic that amalgamate uh, to produce the Paleolithic, what Johnny Pfeiffer calls the creative explosion. Um, so there's the birth of art. That's a new consciousness structure. It's magical, and it's based on seeing the world as a point-like unity of lines of magical connection where everything is connected with everything else. And all you have to know are the correct spells or draw the correct diagrams. If you want to go catch an animal, you draw the diagram and you on the ground and you throw a spear at it. Then at the end of the day, you come back with that animal. So it's pars pro toto. Everything is connected with everything else. Just as long as you know the magical spells uh, to activate this. And for Gebser, the magical consciousness structure is also connected with things like telepathy, uh, ghosts, poltergeists. That's all part of the magical structure. And he believed all that stuff is real. It's actual. Once that consciousness structure is activated, um, this is what all our horror films are about to this day. They are uh, pictorializations of the the latent magical consciousness structure that lies beneath all uh, these other ones. Before you go into the mythical, I think I learned from you that the magical consciousness structure maps roughly onto Joseph Campbell's way of the animal powers. It does. Would it make sense to bring that in now? Because there is a kind of mapping of... Well, let's just footnote that for the moment. Okay, and yeah, sure. Yeah. Continue with Gebser, that Joseph Campbell's idea of the earliest religious structure being the way of the animal powers, which includes shamanism as the primary religiosity there, is pretty much the same thing as what Gebser's talking about here. The magical consciousness structure. Okay. So the mythical, he says, comes in during the Neolithic with the shift into agriculture, 
which corresponds then to Campbell's The Way of the Seated Earth. <laughs> so they do map on very well. These, these models are pretty compatible if you know what you're doing. Uh, so The Way of the Seated Earth, uh, the mythical consciousness structure now shifts into goddess religions. Goddess has become like the primary central icon. Human sacrifice actually also comes in here for the first time on a massive scale amongst a lot of these villages. We find ev evidence for it because they, the, the sacrificed human represents the plant god. The god uh, in illo tempore who gave his or her life so that uh, we could all eat from the plants. Uh, of course, that goes all the way down into Christianity. It was interesting when you, Dorian, and I talked, we talked about how human sacrifice, you know, which is associated with pagan religion and the way of the seated earth and the mythical consciousness structure, is another motif in folk horror movies. Yeah, it's very interesting that... Um, horror movies are basically tapping into these old consciousness structures. Oldest, old yeah, strata. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, yeah. And then, all right, so, uh, so uh, then, so Gebser um, sort of has this overlap with the birth of high civilization as well. Uh, with the Bronze Age, 3500 BC, we get the first cities in Sumer and uh, about 3000 in Egypt about the same time. This is the mythical consciousness structure. Uh, so it overlaps, let, let's say, with the, the late Neolithic for him into this civilization. So he differs a little bit from these guys in, in that and not saying that there's two different structures there. It, it's the same structure that carries on the, the agrarian uh, mentality, let's say. And then so the difference, though, in this consciousness structure is that it's polaristic now. Uh, it's yin yang, um, whereas the magical is unified. It, it, it's, it has a unitary view of the world, everything interconnected with everything else. In the mythical, we get this myth of the separation of the world parents. The sky is separated from the earth. There's a sky father and an earth mother, usually, except in Egypt, it's reversed. It's a sky mother and an earth father. But either way, they, they separate. And we get this polarity between the macrocosm and the microcosm. Um, and uh, the yin-yang image is a, is a perfect image of this. It's polaristic. And this is one of the things that Gebser did not like about Carl Jung because he thought Jung's polarity between conscious versus unconscious was a bit of a regression to the mythical mentality. It's, it's the mythical consciousness structure. He's not yet, for him, Jung has not moved on into the integral consciousness structure. He's, there, there's a certain regress, regression there. So that's the thing about the mythical consciousness structure is that it's polaristic. And not only that, but uh, as Willem Flusser says in one of his books, myths run around in circles. So it's it's all about cyclicity. Um, you, we're back to Hesiod's fourfold model again, which is a perfect exemplar of this. And in a certain way, Spangler also, uh, with his model, fourfold, has sort of reactivated this mythical consciousness structure. Everything runs in circles. So the primary image you can think of it as either the yin yang or the Ouroboros, the snake that bites its tail. That's the mentality of the mythical consciousness structure, and it corresponds perfectly. Then it corresponds perfectly then to uh, Toynbee's designation between a first generation, which is non-philosophical, and a second, which is philosophical. So the mythical consciousness structure is non-philosophical. Okay, so then we move into the next consciousness structure, which of course then comes in with Toynbee's second generation of high civilization and with the Greeks, the Hebrews, uh, the Persians, the Indians, the Chinese, they all have philosophers now. Um, so this is now the mental consciousness structure, which cuts the circle. We're no longer running around in circles. We're thinking in a straight linear way now. Philosophy comes into being based on, uh, it's triadic in its thinking. It's based on thesis, antithesis, synthesis, syllogistic thinking comes into being with Socrates and Plato. And Aristotle, it's a different kind of mentality. Writing comes in, not as hieroglyphs anymore, but as the alphabet. Uh, and the alphabet comes in and enables this kind of abstract thinking because these letters are phonetic purely. They're no longer connected with mythical images. So now human consciousness moves into an abstract mental phase space where now the primary uh, sort of uh, materia that it's manipulating is no longer images, but concepts. Um, so it's a big difference there. And now this makes possible science. And the Greeks, of course, uh, bring science into being. And in its early version, they bring it into being. So that's the mental consciousness structure. And it has two distinct phases, uh, which he connects, Gebser connects with art, pre-perspectival in painting and perspectival. So it shifts in the 15th century with the invention of depth perspective in painting by the Italians 
We're getting a new intensification of this consciousness structure, which is very different from what the Greeks had. The Greeks have a different feeling for space than uh, we in the Northern West have, which right. is perspectival. So perspective comes in and it's very crucial all the way down to the 19th century uh, that we have this perspectival worldview. Yeah, go ahead. Whereas like a Greek, a Greek sculpture doesn't have a background. Right. It's just it's nothing. It's its own space. Right, right. A, a Greek sculpture is that is its space. It, right. it, it inhabits its own tactile space. Yeah, they did. Uh, there are murals at Pompeii and so forth that, that start suggesting perspective, uh, but they never really, you know, they didn't work it out mathematically the way Leonardo and company did. Um, it, it became Leonardo was actually thinking of it as a new science, as like the eighth science to add to the trivium and the quadrivium, which is seven, um, which is significant for Gebser, but that gets too detailed. The number eight is actually for Gebser that it's very significant because it means the breaking out of the cap, the nighttime cavern cosmos of the ancients, what with the, our civilization breaking out. Eight is, <laughs> he's so brilliant. He picks up on these things like, where he's talking about the, the relationship and the opposition between night and eight. Um, and you find this where the the n is dropped and now you've got the eight and then uh he'll look at different he'll look at all the languages because you can find this in all of them italian spanish they all have this opposition uh between night versus eight huh. uh, and there's always a dropping of the n and for Gebser, this is a breaking out of the cavern yeah uh, okay. what yeah exactly yeah you probably in portuguese yeah yeah, exactly. Yep, you got it. This is the kind of eye Gebser has for these little details that are invaluable. They're just, they're so good. Wait, yeah. wait, wait, so wait, why is that again? <laughs> that night is eight? Uh, because he sees the cavern mentality, um, which he associates initially with the magical consciousness structure, but he says that it continues, whether we're looking at the, the Bible or whether we're looking at the enclosed cosmology of the Greeks, where they have to have the earth at the center of the universe, and they rejected Aristarchus's um, figuring out that it all revolves around the sun, actually, um, but they reject that because they don't like the, that idea of infinite space. So it remains a kind of enclosed cavern, nonetheless. Um, but it starts, we, we got rid of the cavern in the 15th century. And you can see it in uh, Renaissance art, where if you look at, like, let's say, Annunciation paintings, where the Virgin Mary is there and an angel is always coming to her, it's always in an enclosed room. And then you can see that room dissolving and disintegrating over time until you get to Leonardo's version of it, where it's out in a courtyard. There's no enclosure anywhere. He's more interested actually in the background right. and the, the vanishing point. Yeah. Uh, this is the whole point of Mona Lisa. She's the mistress of infinite space. Yeah, um, I remember you describing <laughs> her as the goddess of infinite space. And yeah. that's when that painting really clicked for me. Not that I'd spent much time thinking about it, but no one had ever explained to me why that painting holds, it's so important. holds the status. Yeah, because it's, it's like it's just some chick sitting in a chair. Who cares? No, it's, no, it's, the, it's the vanishing point. It's what's going on behind her that, that's the, the innovation there. And uh, so anyhow, so then uh, to conclude with Gebser then, so... We have then we get down to the birth of modernism uh, with the French in the 1860s. Um, in the 19th century, modernism comes in, and then Manet is the first one to come in and start dismantling perspective in painting. Uh, Le déjeuner sur l'air, you know, they're having breakfast on the grass, and then the woman back in the background, if she were perspectively correct, would be a nine foot tall giant. So he's, he doesn't care. He's dismantling perspectival space, whether he did it intentionally or not, doesn't even matter. The fact is it's happening and then it becomes influential and slowly, gradually leads to cubism, mm. the disintegration of any kind of holistic space or perspective at all. It's a perspective. Now, Gebser says we have multiple spaces, multiple temporalities simultaneously captured in a single vision that is not visible to the eye, but to the, the, the mental eye. It's something modernist art is something you have to understand as a hyperdimensional object. It's not something you can see with your visual eyes. And so, but for Gebser then, for, note the difference here with Spengler and Gebser. Spengler says, this is precisely where the West begins to fall apart. Right here with the French, with modernism, with the departure from perspective, which for him meant infinite space. The whole point of Faustian civilization, uh, it's like a betrayal almost. And uh, you leave it up to the French to do it. You know, this is attitude. And um so he's very negative about it, and he sees this as the beginnings of the decline of the West, whereas Gebser says, 
wait a minute, I think actually there's a new mutation of consciousness that has come in here. Let's call it integral, integral slash a perspectival, which now has to do with the managing of the previous four consciousness structures, which can all now be relativized to their particular places and can be activated and made use of in a holistic integral way that has never before been available to us as a culture. And so Gebser is writing in 1949 with this book, looking back at modernism and unifying it with this idea of a brand new consciousness structure. So there's Gebser. So Gebser thought we were just beginning this new mutation, correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's yep. passion. Did he think it was like the final one or did he not really say? Probably not, right? Probably not. The I don't think he would say that because yeah. he knows that there will be another mutation at some point. That, yeah. yeah. I don't think he so, so very quick. Okay, so, so we've gone through... Spingler, Toynbee, we moved to Gebser. It just occurred to me, did we kind of skip over Quigley? And if so, yeah. should, we, should we talk about him really quickly? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Quigley and also this this guy, Borkenau, just with this one interesting paper. Okay. Let's mention Borkenau first. Okay. I, I like this guy. Uh, it, it's just one paper, but it's so damn good. It's in a, a book called End and Beginning, which I think was published in the 1950s, uh, where he has gone through uh, Spangler and Toynbee He's Austrian, and he's comparing them. And he's very interested in synthesizing them. So he comes up with this idea where he adapts Toynbee's uh, three generations of these civilizations. And he says, well, you know, there's a kind of, if we look at the first generation with the Mesopotamians, you know, Sumero, Babylonian, and the Egyptians, they have a different attitude toward death than the second generation, don't they? Their attitude toward, toward death, he calls uh, death transcending. Mm -hmm. And the Egyptians in particular. For the Egyptians, the afterlife was everything. Right. I mean, that's what they did. That's the whole point of their civilization. Uh, you're always worried about your tomb. You always want to make sure you're always planning it out. How's that tomb going to go? It's like the telos, the goal of, of life is how that tomb is going to be built and how is it going to be adequate for me in the afterlife. So there's this kind of death transcendence attitude that he says in the that characterizes the first generation, whereas the second generation, the philosophical one, he says, is more death accepting. They don't care much about the afterlife. Uh, when uh, In the Odyssey, when Odysseus goes down to the underworld, it's pretty dark. Uh, whereas for the Egyptians, it's very brightly lit. If you look at their images on the walls, they're, they're very, the, the afterlife is a, is a bright place for them. So it goes dark for both the Hebrews, uh, who don't like it either, um, and they call it shale. You just throw your dead in a cave and just leave them there and walk away, let them alone. And the Greeks sort of have the same turning away from the cults of the dead. That interestingly, even the Mycenaeans were still worshiping their dead. They, they built the, these uh, Tholos tombs uh, that they hired Minoan engineers to come and build for them. And they put the dead warrior in the tomb with his grave goods um, so that you could go in and make offerings to him anytime you wanted. But after the Dorians have come in, and the Mycenaeans are gone, and the Dorians bring ironworking and cremation of the dead. Uh, this was pointed out by Ervin Rhoda, Nietzsche's friend, in his book called Psyche. Uh, they're cutting the ties to the underworld at that point. When, when you're burning the body, you're no longer interested in ancestor worship. We're, we're cutting the ties there. This is a significant turning point in the West. In my opinion, uh, death cults is one, one of my areas of specialization. Uh, this is a crucial turning point. The West is turning away from filial piety and ancestor worship when the Dorians bring cremation into the West and we start cutting the ties with it. We're no longer interested in it. We're death accepting now. We just accept it as a fact. Yeah, go ahead. Now, one interesting thing that you talked about when you came to Lafayette is that there's some kind of diffusion going on between Chinese civilization and Mesoamerican civilization. I asked you for some examples and you mentioned, for example, the, the use of the color turquoise, I think. Yeah, there's a whole bunch but, but it just occurs to me that ancestor worship is really big Yes, in both, and, and not in the West. Yep, you hit the nail on the head there with Mesoamerican civilization. Olmec, Mayan, Aztec are the three exemplars, and that fits the morphology perfectly of pre-cultural cultural and post-cultural or, or civilizational. Um, and they, in a way, are a regression back to the mythical consciousness structure. Uh, there's no philosophy in that civilization. There was plenty of writing, but most of it was burned by the Spaniards, so we don't have much left of that. Uh, but as far as we know, there, there just wasn't any intellect in this civilization as far as uh, philosophical ideas go. And there are so many affiliations to China with turquoise, uh, the, you know, putting jade in the mouths of the dead, orienting cities on a north-south axis, uh, 
um, which the Chinese do, as well as the Mesoamericans. Um, the, the, the tiger and the dragon are transformed into the shaman who can turn into a jaguar. Uh, and they have the great serpent that becomes Quetzalcoatl. Uh, you, you can see that the, there has been some major trans-Pacific voyaging going back and forth. And their first, uh, you know, the birth of that civilization with the Olmecs is 1200 BC, about the same time as the collapse of the Shang dynasty in China. Some scholars have speculated that Maybe some of these refugees came across the way from Shang Dynasty and had something to do with this, because I'll never forget this. Back in the 90s, I remember one guy who was invited from Beijing. He was a scholar, an expert on uh, Shang Dynasty hieroglyphics. And he came to look at these uh, jade figurines, these Olmec figurines had carved with these celts that have mysterious writing on them. And he says, that's Shang Dynasty writing. I can read it. It says here is founded a new kingdom. And uh, that appeared in Newsweek. Uh, so I got a brief flash, but then um, that's anathema for Western scholars, um, or, or rather American anthropologists, who think that this is this is not correct. They didn't have the wheel. They didn't have metals for a very, very long time. There can't be any affiliation, but th they're wrong. <laughs> they didn't have the wheel because they didn't need the wheel. And they forget Egypt didn't have the wheel either because they didn't need the wheel. If you wanted to go anywhere in Egypt, you went up and down the river until they're conquered by the Hyksos, who bring in the two-wheeled chariot, then they pick it up. Well, we're going to get conquered if we don't have the wheel. Um, so you've got these Olmec, this world with jungles. Um, it's easier to get around on foot than, than with a wheeled conveyance. So these scholars don't figure this stuff out. There's clearly a connection here with the Olmec uh, and uh, Mesoamerican civilization. But you're right, with the ancestor worship, it's a big, big deal in this in Mesoamerican civilization, as it was for the Chinese. But I would almost even go so far as to say that it's a bigger deal even with the Mesoamericans. They may be the, uh, the biggest ancestor worshiping civilization of all time uh, because they never went through phases of getting rid of it like the Chinese did with Chen Shi Wangdi, where they tried to get rid of it and then it would come back and they would try to get rid. Uh, with the Mesoamericans, they never questioned it. It was. You worship your ancestors. That's what you did in this civilization. So um, it's great that you brought that up because I love that. Fascinating. Uh, so going back to uh, Borkana, so... Uh, so we have, right, so that's where we left off. I lost my train of thought. Okay, so those two, so we get uh, the oscillation, death transcending, first generation, death accepting. Then death transcendence comes back with the third generation with the Christians. Christianity. The Christians right. now are interested in the afterlife. They're in, and we start getting all these narratives of, journeys to through the spheres, through other worlds. Uh, there's a whole a patristic literature that comes into being about journeys to the other world. Um, and they're way more interested in it than they are in the physical world anymore. And this goes all the way down to Dante. Uh, Dante is probably the last guy really to give us the celestial journey through the spheres. So after him, then we get the Renaissance, which now is death accepting again. They don't care about the afterlife. They're now more interested in this world, in the earthly plane, in being here, studying it, manipulating it, mastering matter. So we get this oscillation back and forth until we finally get to modernity, which now becomes, for the first time, a total anomaly with Borkenau. Death denial comes in. We don't even admit that there's a, there is an afterlife anymore. The soul doesn't even exist anymore. It's all molecules, atoms, chemistry. Um, and so Bork and I regarded this as a total disaster because we are the one civilization in history that has the, the poorest relationship to the afterlife, to ideas about the soul. It's all atheist materialism and mechanism. So he kind of ends on this pessimistic note, but it's, it's a really fascinating uh, survey. Yeah, I remember one time uh, Noam Chomsky was being interviewed and he was asked if he believed in an afterlife and he just said no. And the person said, why? And he said, when an organism dies, everything that is associated with the organism, including consciousness, and I mean, almost everyone I know, aside from devout Christians, believe what Chomsky believes. And, and here again, you can apply Spengler. That's, that's because that's city consciousness. Yeah. That's atheism means city consciousness. The, the intellect has totally taken over at the end phase of a civilization. That's when you get atheism. And it comes in with, in the Hellenistic world as well. Uh, in their uh, city world, uh, the megalopolitan phase of their civilization. It's city thinking. Yeah, um, I, remember, I remember when you were at Lafayette, you said, there's no such thing as an atheistic peasant. That doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. No, there's not. <laughs> okay, yeah. cool. 
One thing I just want to note is Gebser, like, does he think these mutations have a certain ordering, like things get better? Or is it just they simply mutate? I think they just simply mutate. I don't, simply mutate. I, I, don't think, I don't see it as a progress model. Yeah, right. Um, uh, I, I just I think he's just thinking of it. Oh, here's this consciousness, this consciousness and this consciousness. And they all have their validity um, because they can, you know, if you get a haunting in your house, uh, somehow the magical structure has been activated. Yeah. Uh, let's say uh, when you go to the movies, the, the movies are the mythical consciousness structure. It's all pictures and images. That's exactly what the mythical structure is. So these images uh, are still with us. These structures of consciousness are still with us and they can be activated. At, it's at, funny, like, even if you're just very rigidly empirical about it, there are a lot, like, if you completely dismiss these consciousness structures, there are a lot of uncomfortable facts you're le left with. Like, why do people like horror movies, right? And why is it that, why is it that, why is it that, why is it that John Wayne Gacy's house, like, can't be sold, <laughs> you know? Yeah. If you're really just a complete materialist, um, then why is his house, he's gone now. Why is his house any different from anyone else's house unless, like, there are spirits lurking in that house, right? There's some so, residue of the magical still. Yeah. Being, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, and most people, if you really probe their private crazy thoughts, quote unquote crazy thoughts, they have a lot of superstitions. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. even in New York, they you know when they were building all the skyscrapers, there's no thirteenth floors on any of those buildings. I didn't know that. <laughs> there's no thirteenth. No, um, no. That's um, it's kind of a joke in uh, being John Malkovich. You know when he when he uh, when he's going up to the seven and a half floor that's in between two floors it's kind of a joke on that idea oh, no, oh interesting <laughs> i actually haven't seen that movie but. okay so does that pretty much cover borkano uh, yeah yeah it's, it's just those that one essay i think the only other person on the list unless i'm uh, forgetting someone is quigley yeah. yeah perfect um okay so quigley is the american equivalent let's say of toynbee i'm not sure that quigley ever bothered with spegler but he, he's clearly read toynbee um and he too has seven stages that each civilization goes through. Now, it's, we should point out that Toynbee rejected Spengler's deterministic model that every civilization is fated to decline, disintegrate, break down, and die. But yet, when you look at Toynbee's model, pretty much it's the same situation with all the different societies. They go through seven different stages. Um, and he's borrowed these terms also from biology. The first stage is Genesis. Uh, the civilization comes into being. We have the genesis of civilizations. Then we have the growth of civilization. They go through these great periods of maturity and floresa. Then we have the breakdowns, which uh, is the time of troubles. Like with, with the Greeks, it starts with the civil war between Athens and Sparta. Now we're in a time of troubles here. Things are at issue. Um, and then so then it goes into disintegration, which is total decay. Uh, but the disintegration then produces a universal state, as we have seen uh, the universal empire, but also a universal church. And then finally, we get the heroic age, which is the age of barbarian war bands that come in. It's pretty close to Spangler's model. It may not be deterministic. It may be empirical in the sense that Tunby, you know, wants to examine each civilization first before assuming that it's got a predetermined life cycle. But yet he comes out saying that they all do this. <laughs> so what's the difference? You know, I mean, wh why bother? Anyways, so yeah. now with Quigley, we also have seven stages and his first two stages are together the same as the genesis of civilizations in Toynbee, which is mixture and gestation. Mixture has to do with the fact that early on we get these different ethnicities colliding, mixing together. Uh, in Mesopotamia, we get the Sumerians and the Akkadians, two different ethnicities. Uh, they mix together and we get the birth of Mesopotamian civilization. With Egypt, we get Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, two different societies that have to be united. So we get this period of mixture and gestation. Then the civilization then comes into being after a mixture and gestation. Then we get Quigley's most useful idea, and it, it's a really good one, where he comes up with this idea for the growth period that um, he calls it expansion. So uh, the, yeah. civilization, the civilization has to come up with an, what he calls an instrument of expansion, which allows it to expand both geographically and in terms of knowledge. Uh, and he says, so the first example of this in the West is feudalism. Uh, let's say from 970 to 1270 or something like that. We get feudalism as the West's instrument of expansion. It brings civilization back into being, starting with Charlemagne. And now things are up and running again. Now get an optimistic period. 
But he says, what can happen then is that the instrument of expansion can rigidify and mm -hmm. become institutionalized as feudalism then becomes rigidified into chivalry, uh, which now, so now what you, there, there are three possible responses to this now. Um, you can either circumvent the instrument of expansion as let's say the British did with kingship. They left it intact, but they circumvented it to invent parliament. Um, so you can either circumvent it or you can reform it. By the way, they, they did the same thing with the House of Lords. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Britain, Britain has evolu political evolution, but not revolution. Just whenever yep. an institution becomes outdated, they just they keep they just it leave it alone and go think up something. <laughs> yeah, 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 pragmatic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, so then, uh, so the instrument of so you you can either circumvent it or you can reform it, as Luther tried to do with the church. Yeah. Or then, as the church then did in response, a reactionary response where, with the Counter Reformation, now you know they exert all this force. So those are the three responses. Uh, but then he says, so what happens then during that period is an age of conflict, and the first age of conflict uh, in the West is the uh, the Hundred Years' War uh, from what is it, thirteen thirty seven to fourteen fifty three? I think that the Hundred Years' War. There's all this chaos, and then right coming out of it. Right in the 1450s, then in Italy, we get the second instrument of expansion with the Italian invention of commercial capitalism. They mm -hmm. invent the first banks. Um, they send out all the voyagers, the, the Venetians and the Genoese. They send out all these voyagers to do trade with India and China, go around Africa. Um, so now that's commercial capitalism where you're trading goods that already exist. Uh, they're not manufactured yet. They're, they already exist. You, you trade spices. Uh, salt and pepper, uh, woods, rosewood, teak. Uh, it's all this commerce that's going on. And basically capitalism is now up and running as the next instrument of expansion, which goes on for about 100 years. Uh, and now we have an ex a new expansion in knowledge. We get Copernicus and Galileo that's going along with this. Um, and then so the, uh, the next problem is the 17th century, where there's another age of conflict, and that declines into mercantilism, uh, uh which petrifies. And then we get another age of conflict in the 17th century with the, the, the 30 years war between the, the Catholics and the Protestants, very devastating war. Um, and basically Europe is, a, is, is in a very difficult situation for about a hundred years until the next instrument of expansion comes in with uh, industrial capitalism invented by the British. Uh, so now things are up and running again. Uh, and this has a huge future in front of it. We get lots of knowledge acquisition, geographical expansion with col colonialism, unfortunately. But um, so this is the instrument that goes all the way down pretty much to the Great Depression, where we have the petrifaction of industrial capitalism into monopoly capitalism mm -hmm. at right about the turn of the century there, the turn of the 20th century. That stiffens and we enter another age of conflict uh, for the entire 20th century. He regards it as an age of conflict. And now he wrote this in 1961 or two, so now he comes to the question of what, what will now be the result of this? Mm. He says, there are two possible outcomes. One is that we can come up with another instrument of expansion that will pull us out of this age of conflict as we've seen this oscillation. Or on the other hand, we get the formation of Toynbee's universal state, uh, which he believed correctly that America would, would do. Sp Spangler made a mistake in not seeing America being equivalent to the Romans in this sense. Um, he's really condescending about Americans. Um, but to, uh, quickly, correctly, surmi I think, surmised this by looking at past universal states. And he says, what's interesting about universal states is that they all come from the hinterlands. The Chin barbarians come from these hinterlands to the north. Um, the uh, Macedonia uh, with Alexander the Great is peripheral to the center of Greece, uh, as is Rome. Rome is also peripheral. Um, and, and the Aztecs too, by the way, actually are, are barbar were barbarians that came from the hinterlands. And so America too is peripheral to the center of Europe and fits Quigley's insight perfectly that if anyone's going to create a universal state at the end here, yeah. America would, would be in that role, I think. So that's Quigley's model in, in a nutshell. And I think, let me point out one, here's a deficiency that I see is that unlike Toynbee and Spengler, um, he does not have an equivalent concept, you'll note, for Toynbee's universal church. And so here's American pragmatism rearing its head. Uh, he doesn't know anything about religion. Um, religion is not something that he's studied. He doesn't factor it in. Um, this is just pragmatic uh, 
uh, historical sort of politics. Right. And I also think that in that respect, Quigley is a product of the academic establishment with its regard for specialization. Um, and he has he's nowhere near as broadly learned as Toynbee and Spangler are with regard to culture as a whole, where they exemplify that European ideal. Quigley is much more American in, in his version of this kind of Toynbee and model here. But yeah, go ahead. Interesting. Yeah. One thing I've noticed in the academy, especially in the social sciences, is that religion and really culture is not taken seriously as an explanatory variable. It's it's really just like an epiphenomenon of something deeper that is material. So it's, it seems like Quigley might, might belong to that class of scholars. One thing I wanted to ask is, first of all, what is the unit? Like, so, so Toynbee talks about societies, Spingler talks about sort of culture civilizations. Does Quigley also kind of talk about societies a la Toynbee? Yeah, pretty much. It's pretty much the same concept with okay. Quigley. What does he say regarding the number of times society can create a new instrument of expansion? Because it sounds like Western society. Can that. That's maybe that's a deficiency in his model, but it's infinite. But his model does move, though, through these seven stages from mixture and gestation and on through the instrument of expansion, the age of conflict, uh, then the age of, of decay, uh, breakdown, and then finally barbarian hordes coming in. So it follows Toynbee's model exactly. But again, he's an empiricist who says, well, this has happened you know, in every case as far as we've studied so far, but we don't know what's going to happen here. Uh, it could be another age of expansion that that's, we're waiting for here or not. So right. I, I think the model tends to imply that it could go on for a long time. Right. With in, instruments of expansion, although I'm not 100% convinced that you can do this with the other societies. Um, he doesn't say much about them in terms of instruments of expansion. I think this might be a very Euro, Euro-American model. It works very well for shedding light on our civilization. I'm not sure that, it, that it's going to work so well with the others. Right. I, would need, I would need convincing. Well, and I think you also. I think I also heard you say that in your view, Gebser's integrated con- or integral consciousness structure strikes you as Eurocentric because archaic, magical, mythical, and maybe that even. Mental- with uh, Europe at the top there at the end, because modernism is, I mean, it's just, it's European. What's, yeah. what's going on in India? What's going on in China? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, although he does say, in, in all fairness, he, he does say that uh, the great Hindu philosopher Sri Aurobindo essentially came to the same integral idea with his idea of the, the descent of the super, the super mind, the supramental, as he calls it. Um, he says that it's, it's basically the same thing as integral. Uh, so, although he doesn't really flesh that out much, uh, he gives a tip of the hat to Orbindo, um, but that's about it. Right. And I don't gather, the, I mean, the thing about Gebser is he didn't really regard Indian philosophy as all that important because he thought it was a regression to the magical consciousness structure with this idea of all things being unified, the one, Brahman. Um, he, he regarded that as a, as a regression, but he did see Orobindo as, as an anomaly, as something different. Um, so maybe he does, maybe it's not Eurocentric, but that's the only example I can think of that he mentioned outside of Europe. Two people we didn't really talk about in our previous conversation who you did put on your list are Joseph Campbell. Like we mentioned him, but you didn't really go through sure. why you consider him on that list. Yep. Um, and then we also did not talk about William Irwin Thompson. So what I was thinking is we could begin, you could give a kind of crash course on those two guys and why they are on your list. Yeah. Uh, no, this is funny uh, in a way because it brings me back full circle to where I started. This has been happening a lot lately. Somebody wanted wanted me to teach a course on Carl Jung uh, during February, March. I gave an eight-week seminar on Jung, whom I hadn't read since my 20s. Uh, and, but it's weird how life moves in circles like this. It's kind of a spiral, constantly coming back to where you started. Um, and so this, these are the guys where I started, uh, Campbell, Young, and William Irwin Thompson. First with Campbell. Um, Campbell rescued me from uh, a very poor education at Arizona State University. I was getting C's and B's. I wasn't particularly motivated. Uh, in my studies until I discovered his work. And for the first time, I would mostly read fiction and literature up to that point, hardly any nonfiction reading at all. But it started with Campbell, who was a frustrated fiction writer anyway. So he brings into nonfiction uh, a writer's literary uh, gift, let's say, for eloquence. And um, so I discovered uh, The Power of Myth, uh, a series of interviews with him, with Bill Moyer interviewing him, 
And so I started listening to those and I got carried away and I was like, I have to read this guy's books. So I went to the library and got The Hero with a Thousand Faces and the four volume series called The Masks of God. Uh, and I read through those. Um, from that point, needless to say, from that point on, my grades improved in, in college quite, quite tremendously. And Campbell then introduced me to Spangler. So I, I went to go get Spangler and then I worked through Spangler. And then uh, I had to, after I graduated, I worked, spent a year working through Carl Jung. Uh, and then eventually to William Irwin Thompson, who opened a, a new set of doors. But the world of Campbell then starts with The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which he published in 1949, uh, where he takes a term from James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake called the mono myth. Um, so he takes that term and he creates this idea that all the world's stories and narratives are really telling the same story. They all have the same archetypal structure of separation, initiation, and return. Speaking of circles, here we are again. So the hero uh, is in a bad situation. Uh, Typically, you have a wasteland situation. Uh, let's say at the beginning of Star Wars, you have Luke Skywalker, uh, bored and depressed, stuck in a, in a situation that he doesn't want to be in, uh, or whatever the wasteland situation happens to be. Uh, Arthur holds a conference and says, go find the grail, um, whatever that situation is. So the hero leaves and then goes through an underworld journey, uh, very difficult ordeals, which are personified as uh, fighting monsters, uh, rescuing damsels in distress. Whatever it happens to be, uh, Luke Skywalker rescuing Princess Leia from the modern uh, mechanical dragon of the Death Star, whatever it happens to be, then there's a transformation and the hero finds something that had been missing from the society that it needs to restore it to vitality. He finds that boon uh, and he crosses the return threshold and comes back. Hence, return of the Jedi. Lucas had all this in mind when he was writing Star Wars. Uh, he, he comes back with the boon that completely transforms and revitalizes his civilization. Now there's something new. And so he says, all the myths of the world are enactments of this monomyth, pretty much. At least when there's a hero involved, there's, there's another type of myth that he mentions in the back of the book called cosmogonies, which don't really have to do with the hero journey. That has to do with gods creating the world. That's a different thing. Uh, but the journey myth is, is very distinct. And you, he's right, you find it everywhere. I've read world literature all across the board, China, Persia, uh, the Shah Nama, um, the adventures of Amir Hamza, they, they all have this basic archetypal structure. So then, and Campbell is descended from Carl Jung. Psychology for him is young and Freud, but particularly young, with his idea of the archetypes of the collective unconscious, that all the myths in the world are projections out of the human collective unconscious, which is sort of, we've already seen it outlined for us by Gene Gebser. That is the collective unconscious. That Gebser gives it a structure, uh, but Jung does not. What Jung does is just say, well, there are these archetypes down in there. It's like an abyss, a murky abyss with these ancient patterns, the hero, the wise old man. Uh, but Gebser gives it a structure. Uh, but it's basically the same idea. So, um, so this is Campbell's world. And then he decides he wants to uh, travel to India and Japan. Uh, his mentor had been an Indologist, Heinrich Zimmer, the great Heinrich Zimmer, uh, who never made it to India, actually. He spent his entire lifetime studying Indian philosophy, art, and culture taught it all to Campbell. So Campbell thought he'd make the trip, sort of on his behalf. So he goes to India, and when he's there, he starts thinking about what, what culture shock he's experiencing in India. And he's starting to realize that it's not what he expected it to be. He went looking for metaphysics instead. You know, this is the 1950s, post-Gandhi. Uh, it was all politics. All, the, all they wanted to talk about was politics. They didn't want to talk about yoga and metaphysics and so forth. Uh, he found a few guys that would do that, but it was a different world. Then he went to Japan, and he loved Japan. He fell in love with the place, whereas he thought that the Indians were kind of slovenly. They, they had kind of a, not a great attitude toward technology. Uh, they didn't fix things. They let them break. Everything was in disrepair. Not so with the Japanese. The Japanese were a clean, ordered, elegant, aesthetically pleasing society. The whole idea there is life is a work of art. Uh, it matters how you drink your tea. It matters what your food looks like. I mean, the whole society is like a work of art. So the culture clash here and especially the contrast between India and Japan got him thinking, maybe I'll write a book now this time, not about how all myths are similar, but how they're different because they're locally inflected. Each of the different cultures has a different uh, sort of way of inflecting the elementary ideas, the, the universal archetypes. India's primary idea is very different from uh, China's or Japan's or Persia. So he writes The Master of God, which is in four volumes. He comes up with the idea of the signature, what he calls the signatures of the four great domains. So he comes up with these four mythical figures that he thinks typify the four main, what he calls, mythogenetic zones. For China, we have the Lao Tzu 
figure, the wandering sage who follows the Tao. And he just wanders. Everything in Chinese civilization wanders. It meanders through the Tao. And the Tao is always there shifting and inflecting yin, yang. Now it's yang, now it's yin, back and forth. Um, and then in India, the primary figure there is the Buddha. The Buddha has his eyes closed to the world. The wandering sage has his eyes very, very wide open, as the Chinese do. Uh, but not in India. If you look at all the statues of Indian art, the eyes are always closed. The world is a dream for India. They're more interested in dreaming consciousness than they are in the physical waking world. And so the Buddha per personifies it perfectly, the attitude of withdraw from the world uh, to, to a central still point that's at the heart of it, while everything turns around it, nirvana versus samsara, let's say. Then uh, as we move uh, further in into what used to be called the Levant, the, the Middle East, basically, uh, the, chip, the type there is Job. And the figure in the book of Job typifies the attitude of uh, submission to God, which is the same as it is in Islam, as it is in the book of Job. He ultimately uh, gets an, an argument with God, but he loses it, and he has to just submit, which is the whole point of the book and how it ends, which typifies the whole attitude toward the gods for, for uh, Campbell in the biblical world. Um, God is always right. God always has the final say. Um, you're just a worm. Learn his ways. And then finally, for the West, uh, the figure is Prometheus. Um, in Aeschylus's play, Prometheus Bound, um, Prometheus has the attitude of complete defiance. He says, I care nothing for Zeus. Let Zeus do as he likes. I'm not interested in him. I'm going to bring the fire to humanity. So there's an attitude in the West that's different from these three other domains of total rebellion and rejection. Um, uh, we're kind of a <laughs> kind of a you know, all, this eventually leads all the way down to Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, the wonder child, o always overturning authority in the West. Authority is always overturned. Um, he did not make a distinction, though, as I would and as I think Spangler would and did between uh, the Greco Roman culture and the Northwestern Faustian culture, where the attitude is a bit different. Prometheus, yeah, but in the West, I would add that there should be a fifth guy here, namely Faust, that Faust typifies, uh, he sort of takes the fire from Prometheus and then says, well, now watch this. Not only will we defy the gods, but we're going to learn everything that it is possible to learn. We're going to conquer the universe with knowledge. We're going to learn about every single atom, every single thing, every single mummy. We're, that's the Faustian desire for infinite knowledge. Uh, that is quite a bit different, I think, from the Greek attitude, which had bounds and yeah. limitation. Uh, and is a bit slovenly when it comes to science, let's say. Their science was just sort of higgledy-piggledy. Um, so, so he has these signatures of the four great domains, and then, uh, which is, let's say, the geographical spatial dispensation of the mass of God. But the chronological dispensation has to do with volume one being primitive mythology, which is, of course, politically incorrect now, uh, aboriginal mythology, let's say, which covers uh, the whole epoch of Paleolithic art and shamanism. Uh, down through the agrarian epoch, uh, hunters versus planters, and then the second volume co covers Oriental mythology, which starts with uh, Mesopotamia, uh, the Sumero Babylonian culture, and then the Egyptian civilization. And then he follows the course down through India and through China and looks at all their myths. And then the third volume is Occidental mythology, where he investigates Greco Roman myth on the one hand and biblical myth on the other. Uh, and then finally, with the fourth volume, we have creative mythology. Or Campbell believed that Christianity uh, was what Spengler would call a pseudomorphosis. Mm -hmm. It was a false formation that was forced onto the West. Uh, everyone had to convert by the power of the sword. You have no, no choice in it. But the, the authentic mythology is to be found in Celtic myth and in the Scandinavian myth. The grail myths, um, which are mostly retrievals of Celtic myths through Christian guys, through, through the Christian pseudomorphosis, uh, is the authentic myth of the West, the, the, the myth of the quest for individuation. This goes also all the way down to Carl Jung and the individuation process. The quest for finding who you are, the authentic individual that is metaphysically you. Um, that's the central myth of Northwestern civilization for Campbell that goes all the way down to James Joyce and Thomas Mann and uh, you know the Star Wars films. Uh, these are all creative myths. And this is where we're getting our myths from nowadays, uh, according to Joseph Campbell. Uh, so it's an age of creative mythology no longer institutionalized myths uh, that hold the society together, but we're getting our myths from individuals. Christianity is basically an alien system to it that was exported and forced onto it. But the, the authentic mythologies in the West are Celtic, 
and Germanic, but Scandinavian. Um, and he doesn't think that Christianity ever really fit well with the West. And eventually, of course, it broke apart. Um, and then out of that, he thinks that we're getting our myths actually from our poets and our artists. It's creative mythology now. James Joyce, Thomas Mann, uh, the Star Wars film, whatever. Uh, so that's where we're getting our myths from now, from originally elite highbrow culture. And then near the end of his life, he recognized that it's coming from popular culture, from George Lucas and so forth. So um, so that's that's Joseph Campbell uh, in a bird's eye fly, fly over. Before you go to Willie Merwin Thompson, is there anything to say about the historical atlas of mythology? Yes. Okay. I'm glad you reminded me of that. I, I completely forgot. So at the end of his life, he was in his late 70s. So this was a bit unrealistic to take on a, a task this big. <laughs> yeah. he, he wanted to do this huge encyclopedia of mythology, kind of a rewrite of the masks of God, except now with lots of maps and charts and diagrams, full color illustration. And these books are like, you know, they're, they're tall, large, they're atlases. And um, so he got a good deal with HarperCollins. They were willing to publish it. And so the idea was then to go back through these phases and stages and look at them in terms of four distinct uh, chronological phases, starting with what he calls the way of the animal powers. This corresponds to primitive mythology in which uh, the primary religion is shamanism um, and hunters. Hunters are hunting animals, uh, performing magic. They're in the magical consciousness structure. The shaman is the master of this structure of consciousness, the one who can slide up and down the world axis and uh, visit the other side and get access uh, to the spirits, talk to the dead, heal people, uh, whatever he has to do. He's the one guy, and, and a lot of them were women. Um, a lot of the Paleolithic burials of shamans uh, were, were women. But usually, though, they're deformed. They're crippled somehow. Uh, some of them have been attacked by animals. Uh, and in those small-scale societies, uh, if you're crippled and you can't do work, you can't hunt, you can't you know, weave, you can't do anything useful, so a lot of times these individuals will make up for that then by going on a vision quest. They go out into the forest, isolated, alone, and the spirits speak to them, and they come back to the tribe now with the ability to access the astral world. Um, so they become the world's first religious figures. Um, and the rest of the society, uh, it sounds like every, everybody would like to become a shaman, but as an actual fact, uh, the shaman has a very precarious existence because most of the people fear him. They're terrified of him or her. Um, and if anything goes wrong, it always gets blamed on the shaman because that means his magic isn't working right or a rival shaman from another tribe has put a curse on them. This, again, we're back to Gebser's magical consciousness structure. So he can get blamed. And sometimes in some of these, we, should, we know from accounts of, of the Eskimo, uh, some of these guys are pretty wily. There was one guy there, I think, in Jagnet and in Jagarja, two of these guys, who went to war against their own tribes. The one guy wanted a bride and he couldn't find one. Uh, so he just took her, uh, went armed with a gun, and took her and left. Uh, and the tribe was trying to get at him and he was holed up in his house shooting at them. Finally, they took him to court uh, and no one would testify against him. They were terrified of his magical power. They knew he would put a curse on them if they testified. So that is the magical consciousness structure, which is the same thing as the way of the animal powers. When did that happen? That story about the Eskimos. That's from an anthropological accounts from like the 1950s. Rasmussen is the anthropologist. So you could look up his name, Rasmussen. So then um, we get to agriculture, which comes in 12,000 BC-ish, right in there. The glaciers have melted. The rivers are flowing. They've turned into all the world's great rivers. Um, keep that in mind for Thompson, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, that shift there. Um, so now we're in a different world. And uh, the climate has changed. Now people are, are starting to discover grasses, wheat, barley, and emmer in the Middle East, specifically on the, to the west of the Euphrates is uh, the main zone, Syria and, uh, and Palestine. Um, it's invented there sort of all at once at the same time. And then a new world comes into being of settled villages, people living now in houses and villages. They're no longer nomadic following the game. Um, as the... Uh, what later become the Native Americans do is they follow the game out of the Paleolithic across Siberia and Russia and into the new, new world because the game is constantly moving. So in, in that version of civilization, you're, you're nomadic. But now these people settle, they invent agriculture, which also brings with it now another problem that some people point out, disease now. We've inherited more diseases from barnyard animals right. uh, than from anything else because you're stuck in one spot. Um, so that becomes a side effect here. 
But also now we get a new religious mentality, the way of the seated earth, which involves human sacrifice now, which comes in for the first time where we find evidence of this 8,000 BC at Chionu, which, <clears throat> which is in uh, Syria. And uh, human sacrifice is going on all over the place because the, the human being now is meant, is thought of as the sacred person, is thought of as the embodiment of the plant, the spirit that's in the plants. So to kill the person and cut it up, just as in the beginning, the original myth is that uh, this person was cut up and parts of the body were planted and then food plants sprang out of the parts of the body. So this is the being that we're eating whose death our life depends on. Eventually that becomes apotheosized in Christianity, of course, uh, but that's where it comes from. So then we get, that's the way of the seated earth. Lots of goddess worship is going on. The great mother becomes the primary figure. Then civilization uh, in the high sense comes into being 3500 BC. And now we have the way of the celestial lights. <clears throat> This is the world that now is not only living in villages, but now they're building cities, mm. which require mathematics for very large te uh, temples, ziggurats, and, and Egypt pyramids. So geometry comes in in a big way. Calendars come in. We get the section, decimal accounting system and the decimal system. And it's all based on studying the stars and the paths that the planets make. All of these mathematics come from the study of the heavens and writing. That's the other essential thing because you cannot keep track you can't do astrology without writing because you can't keep an ephemeris. There's no way to keep track of where the planets are at in relation to the zodiac. So writing is bound up with this, this new macrocosmic order. And the gods shift to the stars and the heavens. Almost all the Sumerian deities are personifications of the planets and the stars. So there's a shift away from the earth to the sky. Um, and this, of course, corresponds to Gibbs' mythical consciousness structure. Yeah. So in our last conversation, I think you stated that in your view, what explains the emergence of this high civilization, these societies that have monumental structures and mathematics and writing and a priesthood, the fundamental cause or the root cause or the most significant cause is a transformation in religious consciousness, this view that, that the gods put us on earth in order to basically build temples to them and to the extent that we succeed and run things well down here and build things impressively down here, we will please them up there. If I understood you correctly, you were saying that to the extent that you have an explanation for this eruption or emergence of high civilization, it would be that, a transformation in religious consciousness. Is that correct? Right. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. We, we, we do all this work for the gods because they don't want to do it anymore. So they created us as slaves to do it for them. So we're all in the same boat here. We're working to make the gods happy because if we don't make them happy, then another city will conquer us or uh, there will be a plague. Um, so everything... As with shamanism, everything, there's no accidents. Everything that happens uh, is blamed on the failure of the city to please the gods. Uh, let's say the city is Uruk, and you have a Nana there who's the primary goddess. The, every one of these goddesses has one primary patron, the deity, uh, as well as some others uh, in the pantheon. But there's always one that's supreme to which the highest temple has been built. And if you did not please a Nana, then she will, what's called, the phrase is translated as, she will withdraw her favors. And now you got a, a plague, a pestilence. Um, now you have to, uh, you know, propitiate to the god Namtar, the god of plagues, or Nergal, um, and get it right. So that's their explanation for bad things. That's their explanation for evil. It's our fault because we have failed to please the gods. We're not working hard enough. So get to work. Till those fields, dig those canals. So that becomes part of their work ethic. One thing that's very interesting about you in comparison with most academics and thinkers with whom I interact is that you privilege these sorts of religious explanations. That is, when you're trying to understand why this happened, you take very seriously the religious ideas that might have animated people to start behaving in a new way. Whereas I think, obviously, we talked a little bit about Jared Diamond, but I think it's much more widespread than Jared Diamond. The view that high civilization came into being for some set of much more mundane material reasons, like the development of agriculture and the increasingly dense concentration of human beings leading to the exchange of ideas, leading to technological innovation. I'm not too familiar with 
these more mundane accounts of why writing developed. But I know that many point to, I think, for example, there being like economic incentives to develop writing. So I just want to kind of note that again. It's an interesting difference between the way that you seek to explain the development of human civilization and the way that I think most people in the Western Academy do. It's really just that observation. That's yeah, I, I'm totally familiar with what you're talking about. And it's not that, that the theories these guys come up with are not important. They are. The problem with them is that they're focusing on the part, not the whole. Mm, mm. You have to start with the whole and realize, like, for instance, with writing, classic case, it did come into being for in Sumer, not Egypt, but in Sumer for economic reasons. In Egypt, it was spiritual reasons. It was connected with the graves. Uh, but not in Mesopotamia, it was connected. However, what they miss is that, yeah, it's connected with keeping track of donations that are being made to the priests. <laughs> they leave that part out. It's the temple. So it's connected with the religion. The priests need to invent uh, writing on these uh, tablets in order to keep track of the donations that are going into the temple. Uh, oh, right. That God, that the God is happy. Um, so they, they leave that part out. <laughs> uh, for, yeah, for me, and it's a great point that you emphasize this, because for me, religion is what creates civilization. Um, and it's absolutely necessary. It's indispensable to bring it into being. Uh, eventually, of course, in the late phases, it dies out and you get the atheistic consciousness. But then, and that can go on for centuries. That, that atheism can last for, for a while, but eventually not. Ultimately, it, it won't hold the civilization together because it's not a strong enough belief system to do that. And so it, it, it always signals when atheism comes in, it signals the, the beginnings of the end. Um, because religion is what brings it into being. Religion is what holds it together. Uh, and atheism is just, it's like it, it can gain a, a quite a bit of momentum from that, from religion that can push the atheistic phase on through for a while. But ultimately, it's like the civilization getting tired and wanting right. to go back to sleep. Yeah, back we to can, the earth, like Spanglish. Right. We can huff its fumes for quite a long time. Um, yeah, I. Riding on fumes. That's exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. One thing I'll uh, mention very briefly, and then we can go to William Irwin Thompson, is that so I am not a religious person in that I've never like I'm, I'm very interested in religion and often very moved by it. But I've never taken a true leap of faith where I believed in something really other than what can be demonstrated empirically. And I know that places me very firmly in the category of person who emerges at a certain stage of civilization, you know, urban, industrialized, scientifically rational. I don't particularly like that about myself, like that about the way I think, but that is how I've been up until now. Of course, finding it somewhat unnourishing is part of what has led me to people like you and thinkers like Spinger and has attracted me to religious life, even if I'm not fully a part of it in the way that, for example, some of my devout Christian friends are. Anyway, all of this is to say that I have come to know a lot of deeply religious people in the last few years as I've kind of expanded my circle of friends and set of interests. And it is really striking. And actually, this is understood by a lot of people, that people who really do have religious faith, people who really do hold religious beliefs, it really affects them. Like it really affects the way they behave. It affects the energy they give off. Something really happens to human beings when they go from not believing in the supernatural and in the divine to believing in those things. Right. Things happen to them that are often like very positive. Um, yeah. They have more energy. They glow more. They radiate light. They treat people better. They're more energetic in the service of others. They're more energetic in the pursuit of artistic passion or production. And that's something I've just noticed on a kind of individual basis. People I know who have really taken the leap of faith, it really affects the way they behave. And to some extent, what you're saying really fits with that because you're suggesting that you know when a society truly believes in a religious vision, it's obviously, it's going to affect every member of that society and it's going to affect the whole society and it's going to affect what they do and what they build, right? Um, yeah, I think it's a sobering fact that most people who commit suicide are atheists. Um, that's Cormac McCarthy's last novel, The Sunset Limited, is about. Uh, it's about an academic professor. There's a movie version that's very good, played by Tommy Lee Jones, uh, who's an academic nihilist atheist professor uh, who's had a terrible misfortune uh, and he's going to throw himself in front of a subway 
Then Samuel L. Jackson sees him and comes and saves him, takes him up to his apartment, and they talk back and forth. They, they dialogue about belief versus atheism. Uh, but the guy remains unconvinced. And in the end of the narrative, he does indeed go kill himself and throws himself in front of the subway. To me, that's that's where atheism can lead. There's obviously not everybody who's an atheist commits suicide, but uh, but I think the other way around is, is pretty true. Most most people who don't have religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs uh, are the, the ones who often commit suicide. Not all of them. But, um, but then we should also make a distinction too here while we're on this between re- religion and spirituality. I'm not a religious person either. I'm not comfortable with it. I don't like the dogma. I don't like group think. I don't like people telling me what to do, what I can think. So for me, I resist the, extra, the external pressure of it. Um, it's basically religion is structure, form, and organization applied to spirituality. So the priest reigns in that world, but the priest displaced the shaman. And I go, I prefer the shaman's way. I prefer to interface with the spiritual dimensions on my own by myself. I don't need a priest or a church telling me what to do. Maybe this is part of my Protestant heritage, the, the rejection of authority. I don't know, but uh, I don't like it. And so, I, you know, I'm perfectly spiritual and perfectly happy being spiritual. And it does enliven my life. It, it makes me feel like, you know, shit that happens to me isn't isn't random. This is part of a project. Or this is part of a, a much larger picture that I'm participating in uh, with my own free will. No one's forced me to come here. I came here through my own decision to come back here after many lifetimes. But anyway, those are my personal belief systems. Um, well, well, and, so I, mean, and I, I don't enforce them on anyone else I, because it doesn't it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> yeah. You can do whatever you want. I don't care. <laughs> so, but, yeah, go but connecting the micro to the macro, can you maybe say a little bit more about why and how it matters so much that a whole society of people believes rather than not believing? I guess maybe help us understand a little bit better why it is, how it is that, again, a group of people who hold and share a religious vision can be fully alive and not in decline. Whereas people who do not hold or obviously share a religious vision can't really do that in the same way, at least not for as long. Like there's an end point once they've stopped believing. So why it's important is because it gives meaning to your life. And I think that this, the human psyche was designed for meaning. I think it abhors a vacuum. And, and I think when it doesn't, when it doesn't have meaning, uh, that's when you get the, the the chaos, the suicide, spree killers, serial killers. That that's when you get that shit. There's a reason why that's those kinds of behavior patterns exist and have existed since about 1900. Chicago World's Fair is the first serial killer, 1890 something. Uh, the Devil in the White City. Um, there's a reason why it starts there uh, and why it didn't exist. Those kinds of behavior patterns before, other than suicide. Uh, and murder, but but specific, specifically the spree killer and the serial killer are interesting because they both are uh, directing aggression against their society. It's not so much uh, the personality of the mur- because this, this, the serial killer. It's important to the serial killer that the person he, he, he or she kills. There's only been one or two female um, is not known to them. That matters because then what they're directing their aggression to is not this person, but to the society. To which this person belongs. So now you've got this idea of individuals living in a society who are directing aggression against the society. So something is not working. So something in that social order has gone awry to produce these kinds of behavior patterns, individuals with this much aggression. Uh, and I think it comes from a lack of meaning, a, a sense that my life doesn't matter. It's not important. Uh, there is no meaning to the world. It's all atoms in the void. So why should I get out of bed? Why do anything? Let's go kill a few people. There's no, after all, if I kill some people, um, I'm atheist, right? There's no consequences for that on the other side. Um, there isn't another side, and I won't even exist after my body's gone. There's no me anyway. That's where all this leads. And this is why it's so important for us to connect with the spiritual world, with the, ma- the macrocosm, to give our lives meaning and purpose, and to realize that it, it, our lives are not random. If certain things happen to us for certain reasons because we're going through certain tests. That we were meant to get through. And the whole point of in each individual life is that I believe we come, each of us here, for a specific reason to perform a certain task. Um, you don't remember that choice when you're born because you get a memory wipe, uh, but you did come here to, to carry out a certain task. Now, look at civilization as a whole and say, 
How is it that without that paradigm, let's say we deleted that paradigm, how is it that everybody knows what to do? How is it that this guy is a proctologist? How is it that this guy is a gynecologist? How is it that we have all these cops? How is it that everybody seems to slot out in such a way that it ends up supporting a functioning social order? Kind of curious, isn't it? If the whole thing was random and pointless and meaningless, I don't think it would quite slot out that way. Certain people come in to do perform certain tasks. They're like, been there, done that. Next lifetime, it's a different task. Um, that makes sense, much more sense to me than atheism. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it makes a lot more sense. And I think there's a lot more empirical evidence uh, than people think for um, the belief in reincarnation. Um, it, it just makes sense. Um, so uh, we should move to William Roman Thompson, I suppose, who did believe in reincarnation, by the way. Uh, he's the only one out of this group, I think, who did. Um, and Thompson uh, was my mentor. So I get out of college and I'm reading these guys, uh, Spangler, Young, Campbell, and you know James Joyce and Thomas Mann, this whole world. Uh, I'm discovering all this cool stuff. Yeah, but these are all dead guys. And then so one of the guys in the Joseph Campbell Foundation that I was working for says, oh, you should read this guy, William Irwin Thompson. He used to teach English at MIT, but he got fed up with academia and he left. But now he studies mythology and religion from a totally different perspective than Campbell ever did. Um, he is more interested in looking at science and the relations between scientific ideas and mythological ideas, like the Gaia idea, for instance, uh, that the whole Earth is a single organism um, is kind of the word says it what it is. It's the Greek myth of Gaia. Um, so that was Thompson's sort of main area of expertise. And here this guy's alive. So I go to the library and I get his books, The Time Falling Bodies Take to Light, which is the same which covers the same territory as the Mass of God, but in one volume, it's much shorter, and it's very different. Thompson is, both of these guys were Irish, and Thompson met Campbell once and didn't like him. Uh, and so, But his not liking Campbell um, actually was beneficial for me, because I, at the time I was working for the Joseph Campbell Foundation, and his books just blew me away. Um, it was like discovering Campbell and Spengler and Young all over again, only this guy's alive, so I have to talk to him, I have to find him. Um, so Thompson... Uh, when he left academia, created a series of back in the 70s, what were called then alternative institutions. And he called this thing Lindisfarne, naming it after the Irish monasteries that the, Viking, the Vikings destroyed, uh, to the idea that the, those monks were preserving knowledge in a dark age. Um, so that became the theme of his Lindisfarne Association, uh, where he would bring in, uh, the initial idea was to get science and religion to talk to each other. So he would bring in uh, science guys. And then religious people, you know, uh, Buddhists, Buddhist monks and, and astronauts, let's say, uh, and get them talking to each other. That was his idea was to, to bring those two worlds together and, and get them talking. Um, so then I call him up. I get his phone number. I call him up. I tell him I want to interview him. Uh, and he said, after he hears that I work for the Joseph Campbell Foundation, he tells me to basically go to hell. Um, not not interested in, in Joseph Campbell. I'm hung up on me. But. The, the pearl of great price in that conversation before he hung up was when he said what Campbell never read. Campbell never read Rudolf Steiner. Campbell never read Gene Gebser. Campbell never read Marshall McLuhan. Campbell never read Le Levi Strauss. Now, all of a sudden, I'm like, who are these fucking guys? That's, this is a whole new horizon. So I go to the library and I dig up Gene Gebser. Oh, wow. It's Spangler part two, almost. Uh, I dig up Marshall McLuhan, go through uh, McLuhan go through uh, Rudolf Steiner. These guys have been with me ever since. Uh, and it opened up a whole new horizon for me of knowledge that moved me out of Campbell's confines. Um, so I wasn't so much trapped inside of his head anymore. And I realized there were other vistas beyond him. Uh, and so it just led me out into these very large vistas. So now with regard then to Thompson's theory of culture, um, he, he invents something that he calls these culture, he calls them cultural ecologies. Uh, keep in mind, he's read Gebser. Um, so he doesn't call them structures of consciousness. He calls them cultural ecologies. Uh, he's left-leaning, whereas Campbell was far right, far left. Um, part of the whole 70s, eco ecology, ecology, ecology. So they're ecological ecologies. And in, the original version of them that was that there were four in his book, Pacific Ship. And he starts with what he calls the riverine cultural ecology that comes in after the glaciers melt. So the glaciers melt, which he later adds the ecology for, for that period. The glacial ecology, which concerns uh, both modern and archaic Homo sapiens, what used to be called Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons, uh, that's the glacial ecology. But when the glaciers melt, they form those two rivers, 
in uh, the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. Uh, and now we've got a new world coming into being, uh, which is based on a particular kind of mathematic, which he says is arithmetic mathematics primarily. And it and each one of these civilizations or each one of these ecologies has an ecological relationship to a particular landscape that it ultimately ends up ruining completely. And this is his theory. And he hadn't read Spengler. I turned him on to Spengler later on. He hadn't read Spengler. But in each of these, each one of these ecologies does itself in by ruining its land. And in Mesopotamia, what happened there is that they ruined the soil. Uh, there's constant salinization of the soil, silting it up, silting up the canals, silting up the soils, and s s salinizing. So that the soil becomes, over time in Mesopotamia, unusable, which also neatly fits with Thurple uh, Jacobson's thesis that it's interesting because if you follow Mesopotamian history, it moves from south, from the Persian Gulf, where, where the first cities come into being, to the north, uh, with the Akkadians in the middle there, uh, and then eventually way far north with the Assyrians, um, because the soil is getting ruined, it's getting more and more depleted and ruined, so these societies have to keep finding arable ground. Um, so that's the first cultural ecology. The second cultural ecology is geometric in its organization. And here we have the Greeks. Uh, the, the whole With the Greeks, we get the shift away from the riverine civilizations, and there are quite a few of them. Uh, notice that all the first generations of civilization are rivering. Mm. Uh, the Indus River becomes the foundation for uh, the Harappan, early Indian civilization. And the uh, the Chinese rivers there, the Yangtze, uh, I've forgotten the name of the one in the south. Uh, yeah, those two, yeah, the yellow. And those two bring in Chinese civilization, except for the Minoans, who are the first oceanic civilization. They're, this is not a river-based society. Um, so already with them, 2500 B.C., this is the earliest forerunner of the first oceanic civilization, which then gets up and running with the Greeks. We've got Euclid's geometry. The mathematical mentality becomes geometric, the geometric, and we get all this civilization based on trade of goods and commerce, olive oil and wine and large amphorae uh, get traded to set up an economy. Uh, and the Greeks are constantly having to move populations and export them because their land isn't good for agriculture. Uh, so they constantly have to uh, set up colonies in Sicily and here, there, and everywhere. So that's the second cultural ecology. But what happens to them now is that they deforest their landscape to build their ships. Um, so they're constantly chopping down the trees, chopping, 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 and turning them into their ships. And eventually, the wood starts to get scarce. Uh, and this puts pressure. They have to go on expeditions to Biblos and Syria to get cedar wood. Um, so eventually, they, they run out of steam for that reason. Then we get to the third cultural ecology, which is ours, which is called the Atlantic cultural ecology, which is the uh, mathematics are now Galilean, because they are Galilean uh, dynamical mathematics that lead to the invention of calculus. So we get a whole new cultural ecology that comes in there uh, that shifts into uh, eventually poisoning uh, with greenhouse gases, poisoning the atmosphere. Uh, so Thompson sees that this uh, uh, Atlantic eco ecological uh, society will run into the biosphere. The it's the collision of industrial civilization with the biosphere and the poisoning of the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. And then he has the fourth cultural ecology coming in then with what he called the Pacific shift, where he saw from about 1945 on or thereabouts, from right in there, everything shifts in the culture to the aerospace industries of the Southwest, from New Mexico across to California, which puts the shift on the West Coast. And the for him, the Pacific, <clears throat> he saw the Pacific Basin as a kind of new Mediterranean and our interaction with the Japanese and the Chinese, uh, it, it creates a whole new world of electronic industries uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, so this is a whole new cultural ecology that he sees coming in here with this fourth, uh, fourth cultural ecology. He, he shifts his model around a lot. He adds a few more. Uh, I think I actually caused him <laughs> to, to add one <laughs> because I, so here's the thing. Notice that we went from Arithmetic to geometry to Galilean, and then the mathematics for the Pacific shift is the chaos dynamical theory, uh, chaos theory. Um, and I said, Bill, you left out algebra. Algebra, yeah. Yeah, and I said, uh, Bill, you forgot the the Arabs here. They invented algebra. He's like, oh well. I said, I, Spangler points this out in the Decline of the West, and I think you should read Decline of the West. So he did. <laughs> so I got him to read Decline of the West. And so he added a mentality in between the riverine and the oceanic, which is just called the medieval uh, sort of Islamic mentality, where the mathematics is based on algebra. Uh, 
uh, and algebraic geometries. And so I, I got to add one in there. I, I, I found that that was personally victorious, getting one of these guys to alter his model. <laughs> and he even gave me a footnote. The only time in his books that he ever footnoted me was, was from, from that. So I got credit for it. Thompson just died, I think, last year or the year before, uh, right. mm-hmm. well into his 80s. So. Very recently, yeah. So let me ask you very quickly about Campbell and Thompson. Again, if you had to distill the really key things that these figures saw and got right, what would it be? I think they got everything right. <laughs> That's the thing with these guys. I don't think, I don't really find that they got anything wrong. But here's what I could say, though, a better answer, is that I could say that <clears throat> as far as Campbell went, um, he went up to modernity. Uh, and we saw how Spengler rejects modernity. Gebser loves it. Uh, and so does Campbell. Uh, he never read Gebser. But um, loved modernity and hated popular culture. All these guys hate popular culture. He hated popular culture. Thompson loved popular culture. So he adds popular culture in. And um, it was not until I read him that I realized it was okay to write about popular culture. It's okay to write about Disneyland or comic books or graphic novels. He freed me uh, from that because that's that's my culture. That's what I grew up on in Solus, Megalopolitan, Dying Phoenix. Uh, that's the culture that I, I grew up on. And he gave me permission that it's okay to write about it. Because prior to that, where I was sticking with Campbell, I was being a snob and I was like, no, 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 you can't write about movies. And that, so Campbell really narrowed my vista, whereas Thompson expanded it and gave me the permission to move into popular culture because um, that's where we're at. I guess what I was trying to ask about Campbell and William Irwin Thompson is you created this list of thinkers who you think are indispensable analysts of civilization. And it is somewhat possible, even if it's very superficial, to sum up in one sentence their innovation or their contribution, what they added to the conversation. So just for example, Spingler presents this idea that civilizations behave very much like organisms and that they are mortal and they go through a kind of matura- a, a flourishing, a maturation process, and then a decay, aging, and death process. Toynbee, one really critical thing he adds to that is that there have been multiple generations of civilization over time, whereas Spingler really just treated each civilization almost as like an independent, equidistant monad. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, what would the sort of one to two sentence articulation of the contribution in your view of Campbell and then of Thompson B. That's sure. what I mean. Yeah. I think with Thompson, it's obvious he brought to, he distills down this idea that civilizations are related to their environment in a very destructive manner. That, that's it. It's the, they're all limited because of that. Whereas these other thinkers, everyone pretty much misses it except for Spangler has a hint of it in the end of uh, volume one of the decline of the West, where he says, hey, look, the West is putting all this pressure, this mechanical industrial pressure on the entire planet. That can't go on forever. Um, he was really the only one to, to suggest that for precisely the stresses that we're putting on the planet, the Faustian civilization is putting on it, uh, limits its life. There, you can't do this forever. There, there's a limit to growth, which is the title of a famous 70s ecological book, Limits to Growth. Um, but, but Thompson really brings that vividly to your attention. And just for fun, I asked him, I said, what do you think the pollution of Mesoamerican civilization was, Bill? And he goes, oh, I don't know, maybe astral pollution from their magical interaction with the astral plane. Maybe there's too much of that. Uh, And I said, "Uh, also, so what do you think about China? What's the pollution there? And he's like, People pollution, maybe there's just too many fucking people. It's, <laughs> they're going to run out of space. <laughs> so just for fun, I, I wanted to push him. Um, but yeah, for, for Thompson, that, that's it in, in a sentence. And then for Campbell, uh, what Campbell brings to our understanding is the understanding of mythology as cultural morphology, because he takes Spengler's method and applies it specifically to all the world's myths in a morphological way that enables us to handle and understand myth in organizable ways. Uh, Otherwise, and this is the case if you read Young, it seems overwhelming because Young didn't organize it. He just has all these archetypes, all these different myths that he talks about, and it seems like it's chaos. But uh, Campbell brings in morphology and organizes it. Suddenly we have a monument. Suddenly we have four distinct signatures of the four Uh, great domains. We have four chronological epochs. Everything comes out nice and neatly and comprehensible. So now it's not overwhelming. And Campbell brought that order to, to myth, I think, better than anyone ever did.
he orders the myths both geographically, almost ethnoculturally, yes. and, and uh, chronologically. Right. Okay. Yeah. I came up with something very simple, a very simple framework that I think is nevertheless very helpful for organizing the thoughts of these thinkers. And so I want to kind of present that framework to you, and then we can kind of go piece by piece. It's a three-part framework. But really at any point, as I'm going through the framework, you might want to stop and say something. Now, before I say what the framework is, I wanted to back up and ask a prior question, which is, in these conversations we've been having, what, in your view, is the unit of analysis? Or does that differ from thinker to thinker? Meaning what exactly? And what I mean by that is, it's something like civilization. Spengler has nine. Toynbee has over 20. But like, what is the unit that we are interested in here? The unit of analysis is civilization, or yeah. or Toynbee uses the word societies, uh -huh. which is better because it's more broad. If we say civilization, then uh, then that means everything that starts with the Sumerians after that, but we're also including the Neolithic and the Paleolithic as well, so it has to be human culture as a whole. You could borrow from Deleuze and Guattari and just say, we're studying social formations. Mm. Uh, so that might be a better word. I like that phrase, so, social formations. Okay, and we don't need to spend much time on this at all, but when we talk about a civilization or a society or a social formation, what are we talking about? How, how human beings are in the world, how they live, what they do. <laughs> they're social and they're cultural. They're socio-cultural, uh, but they're not randomly so. Right. That's why we're looking at it from all these different guys' perspectives. It's not random, it's structural. So we're analyzing the structures of uh, human social formations and the way individuals interact on the physical plane. But they are self-contained entities in a sense, and there can be yeah. multiple yeah. ones at any given time on the globe. Yeah. What is it that makes a social formation? Uh, there's a kind of glue there, you know, that yeah. it's, people stick together and then it becomes like a, a unit. Maybe yeah. it's like an amoeba. Uh, Spangler uses that metaphor for the Neolithic, where he switches from the plant as the metaphor for high civilization, but the amoeba for these Neolithic societies, which are much more diffuse and broad, geographically spread. Um, so whatever the metaphor is, it's, it's a kind of way of getting at the glue that sticks people together to create a whole. Okay, so I think for the purpose of this conversation, I'm just going to use the term civilization. That's fine. Even yeah. though you could use different ones. You know what the negative connotations of that are for Spengler, that, that yes. word. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you could call them, I think Toynbee is more in agreement with this, than you just call them civilizations. Yeah. Okay, so, so our unit of analysis is civilization. And the framework that I developed for organizing the thought of the various thinkers we've discussed, it's a tripartite framework. There are three basic questions. The first question is, what do all civilizations have in common with each other? In other words, what are the common characteristics of all individual human civilizations? What can we say about the nature of any given single human civilization? That's one question. And then there are two questions that are comparative in nature. One is chronological and one is geographical. So the chronological question is simply how have civilizations changed sequentially over time? And then how do civilizations differ across space or geographically or ethnoculturally? So again, if we ask these three questions, what characteristics do all individual human civilizations have in common? In other words, what is the nature of a human civilization, generally speaking? And then these two comparative questions, how do civilizations change over time and how do they differ across space? That is a useful set of three questions for, again, placing all of our different thinkers. And so what I wanted to do is kind of walk through each question and talk about how some of the thinkers answer each question. So let's take the first question where you're just looking at an individual human civilization and trying to figure out like what we can say about any individual human civilization. In other words, what characteristics they all have in common. Well, here I was thinking we could kind of divide this question into a question about the exterior of civilization or the objective features of civilization, and then the more subjective or interior features of civilization. So the first sub-question of the first question would be, in an exterior sense, what do all individual human civilizations have in common with each other? Um, and there, there's a lot to say here. So one thing Spingler would say is that every individual human civilization has a morphology and is mortal. 
every individual human civilization is born, flourishes, matures, ages, and dies similar to an organism. Really, no one challenges them. I mean, they may not use the language of morphology, but no one seriously challenges the idea that, again, just viewing civilizations from the exterior, they all seem to give birth, flourish, decay, and die. So maybe that's one thing. And in fact, that may be one of the strongest or most defensible claims that we can make about every individual human civilization. Although maybe that claim is contestable. In any case, that would be one claim we can make. Another claim we can make about individual human civilizations is that each one passes through a set of stages, or at least some thinkers say that, right? So like Spengler says it with the spring, summer, fall, winter stages, and Toynbee and Quigley both have these seven stage models, which are pretty similar to each other. No. Okay, so civilizations kind of have a morphology and or mor- and are mortal. They pass through a set of stages. There are different forces that bring them into being. This could be challenge and response. This could be the mixing of two cultures. Um, this could be like the mystical relationship between the people and the landscape. But in any case, there are different forces that bring any individual civilization into being. And there are different forces that drive progress and decay. And here, like, you know, Spengler doesn't really posit a mechanism. He just says it's the morphology of the metaphorical organism that a social formation is. These stages are just inevitable. And you don't ask what causes them in the same way that you don't ask what causes a human being to mature and then to age and then to death. So one force is just the kind of organic morphological force that drives both progress and decay. Thompson talks about how environmental factors provide both the fuel for growth and then the exhaustion of those environmental factors leads to decay, right? So so he really thinks like the environment is a very important force driving both progress and decay. Quigley thinks that institutions and more specifically this instrument of expansion is a really important force driving progress and decay. It's a social technology that generates surplus, that produces innovation, um, and then it tends to petrify, rigidify, calcify, ceases to be a source of novelty, deadens in a sense, uh, and that's what leads to decay. And then finally, different thinkers would probably argue that great individuals, or maybe great groups of individuals, like Toynbee's creative minority, or for Quigley, the people who reform or circumvent instruments of expansion or create new ones. Great founders, like the ones that Sam Oberja talks about, are also forces that drive progress and decay. But in any case, the general point is, so a lot of what these thinkers are talking about is what we can say about any given human civilization viewed from the exterior. There's a morphology and a kind of mortality. There are stages. There are forces that bring them into being, and and the different thinkers have different thoughts about that. And there are forces that drive progress and decay. And again, the thinkers have different views on that. So that's viewed from the exterior. But then there's like viewing individual human civilizations from from an interior point of view, or from a more subjective point of view, or an intersubjective point of view. And here I think Jung and Campbell posit that substantively, actually all human civilizations have certain mythological patterns and ideas in common. This is archetypes of the collective unconscious, which are common to all humanity and therefore part of the collective mythological imagination of all human civilizations, because they're things that all human civilizations have in common with each other across time and space. And this for Campbell is the monomyth, hero's journey of separation, initiation and return. So Jung and Campbell give a kind of a pretty substantive answer to the question, what do social formations have in common with each other subjectively or from an interior point of view? It is this myth, at least for for Campbell, of the hero, the hero's journey of separation, initiation, and return, that all human civilizations have that myth. Stingler really focuses on the different myths or the different ideas that animate different civilizations But he does think all civilizations have some kind of Ur symbol, some kind of animating image or idea. So even though they differ from civilization to civilization, all civilizations have one. That is what brings them into being. It underlies all of their art and their thought. Again, it comes out of this mystical interaction between the people and the landscape. And it has a kind of finite potential. Once it is actualized, it becomes exhausted or exhaustion and decay set in. So in summary... I think that a lot of what we've talked about, it can be kind of slotted into this big question, which is just what is the nature of any given human civilization? And then you could, again, view that 
objectively or from an exterior perspective or subjectively from an interior perspective. So let me stop there and just ask you if you have any reactions to that. Um, well, it was an excellent uh, framework here. I like this, uh, especially this distinction between the exterior and the interior. Um, I know that's influenced from Ken Wilber, so I, I understand where that's coming from. But it is it, it is a good a good way to look at it that they have this sort of what is the exoskeleton of, of civilization and what is its endoskeleton? Well, the endoskeleton is the human psyche, and the exoskeleton is how forms appear within a culture: uh, the physical forms, the technological forms. Uh, that's the sort of exoskeletal stuff that is hiding the human psyche within it, which is the thing that is actually uh, producing these forms on the physical plane and making them manifest. What we do is we take our thoughts, we have thoughts, and we translate them into physical reality. So uh, everywhere you look when you walk down the street, in whatever society you're in, you're looking at human thought that has been materialized out into space and time right in front of you. So that's what we do as a species, um, as this higher species, modern homo sapiens, uh, that we are. That's our particular gift and talent. We manifest thoughts and make them physical. But it's not done in a random way, as, as we're realizing here from looking at all these guys. It's, it's not random. These thoughts that do manifest and turn into culture, art forms, architecture, uh, do so in a very ordered way, in a sequential way. You don't just start randomly. Um, like, for instance, study the life of a painter and you look at the early you know, early Picasso and he takes him a while to figure out his game. And then there comes a magical point, in his case with Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, uh, which he paints, this giant monstrosity, which then becomes his, okay, this guy has now on his game, he's out of the pre-cultural phase of his life now. Now he's hit the, the high, the first of the high cultural phases, and and then it goes from there. Um, and even the life cycle of uh, you know people who die young, let's say like Heinrich von Kleist, has uh, wrote all these short stories in the time of Goethe, um, short stories and plays. They're absolutely brilliant. Uh, tragically, in his case, he he, uh, he and his girlfriend ended up in a murder suicide. He, he shot her, then he shot himself. But Kleist's work, as you look at it. It's pretty much done. Um, it, it, he did it quickly and rapidly and early, but, but it's all there. It's all that we need. And Goethe analogizes this to, there is something in botany which is called, and I think it was Linnaeus who pointed this out, that a plant can anticipate, because it has poor soil or poor conditions, it has a sort of premonition that its life cycle is going to be short. So it flowers very rapidly. It flowers very quickly because uh, it knows. Something in it knows. Um, so we're dealing with life cycles, morphological life cycles uh, of all different kinds and all, all different scales. Yeah, go ahead. What you said, it reminds me of all the rock stars who die at age 27. Yeah, they're at 27. Yeah. <laughs> the, the magical age of the 27. The, yeah. The, what's it called? The 27 club or something like that? No, but that, it's a perfect example. And most of those 27 year olds, you know, they, they did what they came here to do. They just anticipated it somehow and did it very quickly you know, before the drugs caught up with them or, or whatever it was. It's the same principle, this anticipation of a short life. Jim Morrison in particular, who is the member of the 27 Club with whom I'm most familiar because I was just obsessed yeah, with the Morrison when I was younger. But he, I mean, he even looked the part by age 27. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. looked old. He, had this he was body. already in his fat Elvis phase <laughs> at, at 27. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, was, it was rapid. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, but then cultures do this, and uh, cultural developments. You can always see that there's a there's a life cycle to to anything. Um, the development of a TV series, like you know, you can take something as ordinary and mundane as a TV series, where the first episodes, ah, they're okay, then they get really good, and then the last ones are kind of like, okay, guys, it's it's time to let it go. That's yeah. sort of like Seinfeld. Let's say the morphology of Seinfeld, and the reason for that is because once you initiate something. Uh, on whatever scale, if it's the scale of civilization or the scale of a TV show, there's only a certain number of possibilities that are there from the start to actualize them. Uh, and once they're actualized, at the end of the cycle there, um, those possibilities are, have been actualized. And so if you keep going, let's say the TV, Seinfeld was done, let's say episode, but let's say seven seasons and they went two more, but the last two are kind of just repetitions. 
of their own archetypes. They just become semantically depleted. So all that you can do at that point is just repeat what's, what you've been doing, and now it's boring because it's done. It, its life cycle is finished. Uh, and that's just the way human culture works. That's, that's the way it works. And it's interesting because institutions that are born during the period of flourishing do become self-perpetuating and self-preserving. That can lead these forms or institutions to last longer than they should, right? And even to obstruct Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, India and China are still in existence. Um, why are they still in existence when they're semantically depleted, metaphysically exhausted? Um, for one thing, you could say that in those cases, they're initiating archive. Their originary forms were so incredibly powerful that they can sort of cannibalize them. They're, they're still living off of their dead past, even while industrializing, importing the external pseudomorphosis of Western structures, economic structures um, that sort of just, uh, it's like putting a, 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 a dying guy on life support. You know, you, India and China are living on life support. Um, and also the, the cannibalizing of their metaphysical, their original brilliance. Um, the Roman Empire did not do this. It's not still around because in its case, uh, its immune system was weakened by Theodosius the Great, who uh, anathematized all the pagan forms, and then it became prey for the external proletariat of the barbarians to just come in and, and, and chop its head off with ease. Um, so these civilizations are all moral. But the, uh, the interesting thing, the thing I like about Toynbee in opposition to Spengler is that how, Toynbee really highlights how they all die in different ways. You know, the, the Byzantine civilization exhausted itself after Justinian's conquest of the Mediterranean. He wanted to be, you know, the Roman Empire all over again. So he expended all these resources, all this money, all this talent on, on doing that conquest as a tour de force. And then that civilization is done now, semantically depleted. It used up all its energy on a single tour de force. Now it's easy prey for the West, and the West comes in during the Fourth Crusade and pretty much chops off its head. The Ottomans finished them off, you know, in the in the 15th century. Um, so it's it's interesting how they, they they die in different ways, just like human beings do. Everyone dies in a different way, um, or in typal ways. A suicide is a typal way of dying, so it's another it's a category versus someone who dies of old age, let's say. So there are typal categories. But each individual approaches that typal category of death in a different way. Uh, might die young in a car accident. You know, uh, same thing with civilizations. And so this is what fascinates me about studying these societies is how and why they come into being and how and why they expire. Because I think we're in agreement that no matter from which one of these guys you look at, it is they are they're all mortal. Um, everything that comes into being is mortal, uh, even through human thinking. Uh, projected out onto the physical plane in space and time. Uh, everything has a life cycle. And even yeah. Spengler, I think, would acknowledge that the life cycle can be cut short by some sort of external force, right? He's more saying, like, just as the natural or maybe the ideal life cycle for a human being would be to be born, to grow, to flourish in your 20s, then to mature, and then to age into your 60s, 70s, and 80s and die. And that process could be cut short by some kind of external force. Right. You're exactly right. Same thing with these civilizations. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, the, the Mayan Aztec culture also is another example of getting cut short. Uh, with the Europeans coming in and encountering the Aztecs uh, and just lopping their heads off because it was already a weak, dying society. The Aztecs are the equivalent to the Romans. Uh, it was already a very stiff and petrified society. If you look at Aztec art and compare it to Mayan art, there's no comparison. The, the Mayans were like the Greeks. I mean, it's beautiful. And the anthropologists even naively make reference to this in their naive academic classification of uh, what they call... Um, Pre, uh, uh, let's see, pre-classic, classic, post-classic. Those are the, the terms that they use. Yeah. <laughs> pre-classic is, is the Olmecs. The Mayans are the classic and the Aztecs are, are post-classic. So they even are naively suggesting that there's a life cycle there in the use of those uh, three terms. Um, okay. I'm going to remove this background because it's distracting me, but I just, it's one of the <laughs> backgrounds I had to include it. It's beautiful though. It gives you a, uh, uh, a sense of the beauty of Mayan art. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Minoan Cretan art. It has that same kind of colorful brilliance to it. Um, yeah. yeah, kind of an oceanic blue. Yeah, yeah. Even though it's the sky, obviously. Can you think of a good example of a civilization that was still very healthy and flourishing and, and got 
destroyed by some external force. And you talked a little bit about Toynbee's notion of an abortive civilization. That's very interesting. And, I, and the answer is uh, no, not really. Uh, because what happens is when a civilization is in force and it's at its fullest, strongest point, it's just kind of immune to those kinds of things. So they tend to get lopped off in the beginning of the pre-classic or when they're old, uh, which is when in human life, uh, our children and our old people are the most vulnerable. So it naturally follows. Uh, like he talks about the abortive example, of, an example of abortive society are the Irish Christians. So you have Irish Christianity there, which had its own flavor to it. It was very different from Catholic Christianity. It had a, a unique uh, Celtic consciousness to it. It was totally unique. Uh, they had all these cool manuscripts. They basically invented the illuminated manuscript that was their culture in places like Iona and uh, Lindisfarne. And uh, then the Vikings come and, and, and chop their heads off very quickly and early. And then so that's an example of a, a, an abortive civilization. Um, so, yeah, it, I really I like think of an example where, where this happens when a culture is in full force. It's almost like, you know, yeah. Napoleon at his apogee. He was like, you can quote me on this. Nothing's going to stop me until my destiny is fulfilled. And that's exactly what he did. You know, he, he knew he was unstoppable until it what until he wasn't. And, and the morphology shifted. I mean, this analogy is so rich and it suggests something really deep about the nature of reality. Just as young people and old people are the most vulnerable, pre-classical and post-classical are when civilizations are the most vulnerable. One interesting disanalogy might be that if you're a flourishing 25 year old young man or woman, you can get taken out in a car accident or get murdered. It may be that civilizations, like, there isn't really an analogy for that. No, not that I could think of. Yeah. Because uh, they become so powerful when they're at their apogee yeah. and their full metaphysical greatness, which then also translates into physical power, right. you know, technological power. They're really unstoppable up to a certain point. I can think of the, let's say, the Hittites um, who were cut short. Uh, they're only on the stage there for about five centuries, these Indo-Aryans who adopt Mesopotamian culture. Very strange. Um, so they're a kind of anomaly, what, what Toynbee calls a satellite society of the Mesopotamians. And they're wiped out by the Sea Peoples. Um, but it's interesting because even the Egyptians could not defeat them. When the Egyptians were conquering the Middle East, they were stopped by the Hittites. They were so tough that they, they could not defeat them. Uh, but yet here comes this flood of barbarian Sea Peoples and just submerges them in a human tsunami, you know, and that's it for them. But they had only been around for a few centuries, three, four, maybe five at the most. So uh, they, I suppose, would be another example of being cut off during their pre-classic phase before they really get going. Okay, so kind of what we've done so far is we've talked a bit about this first component or question, which is just looking at really individual human civilizations and what we can generalize about them. And you can generalize about the exterior or exoskeleton or the interior or the endoskeleton. And I had a few questions within this question uh, that I wanted to put to you. First of all, just a note that uh, I think we've already talked about this, but it does seem like the Anglos are more interested in the exoskeleton and the Germans are more interested in the endoskeleton. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Different thinkers have different views on almost the moral or normative quality of particular stages in a human civilization's development. For example, you know, some might think that the birth of cities is a really good thing, whereas other thinkers might be more partial to the rural, more religious phases, right? Spingler is obviously, his heart is with the cultural phase. Um, I'm not sure if any of these thinkers are kind of the opposite, where their heart is with the grand civilizational urban phase. I think today there are a lot of people who probably think megalopolises and technological progress are a sign of improvement and dynamism or, you know, something to be positively valued. One question we could briefly discuss right now is, if it is the case that civilizations pass through these stages, do thinkers differ on what the best stage is? Or is that a dumb question? And one relationship question is, you said that William Irwin Thompson was the person who freed you, in a sense, to embrace and write about pop culture. So one question I, I would put to you is like, is pop culture associated with one stage in particular, like maybe the civilizational or yeah. the winter stages? And yeah. Maybe it's not, because even there's like folk, well, I don't know. So, so that's a question. And then like a related question is, don't some of our thinkers differ quite sharply on the value of pop culture? Like Spingler is very no. dismissive of it. I think Campbell is pretty dismissive of it. 
William Irwin Thompson, though, kind of freed you to embrace it and write about it? So, a really good question. Uh, the, the situation with pop culture, because comparatively, when you look at the civilizations, pop, pop culture comes out of folk cult culture. So, in a certain sense, it's always there, but submerged. Um, you know, Grimm's fairy tales are stories that were recounted by grandmothers, let's say, to their five year old kids. Um, so, then that, who knows how long they've been doing that? Probably forever. Um, but there comes a certain point when the civilization becomes interested in folklore, folk culture, and then because the civilizational clearing, to use Heidegger's term, is so bright and large, um, then the submerged stream, once it enters that arena now, is on stage. And now it's pop culture. It's no longer folk culture. And that arena is only created in the megalopolitan phase. The, in, in, in Egypt, it's the New Kingdom, which is the imperial phase. Uh, because that's where all the bread and circuses are, the, the spectacles. And so uh, people come on stage with their crappy pop art. It doesn't have to be artistically sophisticated. It just has to be fun and entertaining. Tell us an entertaining story. So we get with the Hellenistic world, the creation of the novel, which first comes into being with Hellenistic writers like uh, Lucius Apollias and the Golden Ass. A whole bunch of those, a new genre comes into being, which is completely derided by the sophisticated men who regard the novel as just, ah, it's just pop nonsense. Um, but no, it's they were on to something. That became the future of the novel. Uh, it turned into something highbrow or gradually over time. Also, too, uh, pornography is something that, that I've noticed that comes in during these end phases. In Egyptian art, we first start seeing it appear during the New Kingdom. In India, uh, it becomes so popular at the tail end of their civilization that they're building entire temples decorated with pornographic art. Um, they loved it. Uh, and so, in a way, they were taking the pop culture, the pornography from, from the pop culture, and elevating it, plugging it into the high culture, the art of sculpting and designing temples, which requires very sophisticated men to do this, to plan it mathematically. You know, these guys, uh, <laughs> and I don't know how these guys, I often imagine uh, these guys sitting there kind of carving, you know, this couple having a threesome, you know, in very loving detail. What's going through his head? And how, and the discipline that's involved in being able to do that. <laughs> Those guys are amazing. Uh, but again, tail end of the civilization. It's not there in the, in the earlier phases. Um, so I think that pop art is definitely a megalopolitan thing. It's, it's tied in with big cities. Um, so that's that would be how I account for it. But I love it. I mean, it's fun. It's a blast. How can you not love it? Pop, pop culture, comic books and movies and graphic novels. I love all that stuff. So There are these figures like Campbell and Spingler who have a more negative view of pop art. Can you maybe summarize why? And I also just wanted to mention one other thing, which I thought of when you mentioned pornography, which is one of the more interesting things that I got from Camille Paglia, and it's probably not original to her, is that masculine feminine polarity diminishes in the megalopolitan phase. Men and women become less distinct from each other. She's right about that. Yeah. yeah. It's a question of why. So why do they have this attitude? Um, the Germans are an interesting case here because I think across the board they derided pop culture. I don't think there's one example of them liking it. I can't think. It's not just Spengler. Uh, Spengler, Heidegger, Rudolf Steiner, um, all the great minds during this period derided uh, popular culture and even above that, modernist culture. They even derided modernism. And so the interesting thing with the Nazis here, if, if you bring in the Nazis, the Nazis take that general mentality and just crank the knob up. Now it becomes degenerate art. They're holding exhibitions of here's degenerate art, modernist art, Kandinsky, uh, Paul Clay. This is all degenerate art because it has departed from the norm. What they regard as the norm then is neoclassicism. So the regard for uh, you know, restraint. Classicism is all about restraint. The beauty of the human form, the simplicity of architecture, um, it's not overly ornate. Um, there's not all of this busyness. Uh, it's restrained. Uh, in Winkelmann's words, you know, the, the Greeks are noble, calm, and beautiful. Uh, that's before Nietzsche came along and figured out, oh, no, there's another, you're talking about Apollo here. There's another stratum, the, the Dionysus stratum that you left out, where they like to hold orgies, get drunk and hold orgies, and tear animals apart. Uh, not quite so noble and simple, but there's <laughs> there's a, there's an oscillation there in, in the Greeks. Nietzsche was the first to point that out, um, so he deserves credit for that. Um, I think that Nietzsche would have and should have liked popular culture, and I can't think for sure 
whether he did or didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe he didn't in his writing, but I'm willing to bet he was such a fun guy. There's no way he couldn't. I, I bet in his personal life he, he did. Yeah. Uh, we know that he went to see prostitutes on a, on a regular basis. I mean, yeah, this is this is the kind of guy who's probably thought pop culture was a blast, but did, just didn't want to write about it because you don't do that in in this kind of discourse. Um, but now, for as for the the attitude as as to why uh, the Germans as a whole, and part of this has to do with the semiotics of why World War II happened, even uh, or, or both World Wars, why, why they happened, because the Germans. Uh, resisted modernizing. They resisted. They were late to industrialize. Um, they're always slow to catch up. Um, the German philosophy takes forever to get going, but then once it does, it's fireworks, you know? Yeah, well, and, and they position themselves in opposition to the kind of soulless, capitalist, shopping mall Anglo-American. That was, yeah, that was Hitler's idea, you know, to design uh, a new city called Germania, you know, with Albert Speer as his architect that would just be this place with no shopping malls. That was like their worst nightmare. Uh, the American Anglo world of shopping malls and department stores uh, and everything being commercialized. They, they just hated that. And so part of it is the German temperament. Well, it's And it's a funny thing that a lot of you know, American progressive sophisticates have in common with the Nazis. Right? I mean, they don't, they don't like it either. <laughs> right, exactly. Funny how this works, isn't it? Uh, but no, so it's just two different worlds that the, the Allies... And uh, the Nazis, uh, the, the Axis powers, are, are trying to create. It's just two different worlds. The Japanese have shared, the only reason they're allies with the Germans is because they share the same conservative mentality. Uh, modernity is, all, is a nightmare. They want to go back to the emperor and emperor worship and, and you know, almost samurais. I mean, they, uh, the, uh, the kamikaze pilots are like neo-samurais. Yeah. You know? um, yeah, so that they share that similar mentality of wanting to resist modernity even while create, fulfilling it, ironically, by both of them trying to create a universal state, Japan trying to create a universal state out of the uh, Pacific, and the Germans uh, with Europe, uh, trying to redo, the Germans are trying to redo what Napoleon tried to do and then failed. Uh, and ironically, they both made the same mistake uh, in turning against the Russians. Russia. You don't do that. <laughs> they have an infinite number of people, no matter how many of them you kill. There's, they're like, it's like trying to get rid of ants. Yeah. It's not going to happen. <laughs> So, so interesting how all this plays out. Uh, but the Anglo-American world it just has this shopping mall world, and the French too as well. Shopping malls would remind ourselves it began in France with the arcades uh, uh, that Walter Benjamin writes about in the 1830s. That's where it starts, and then the, the arcades give birth to department stores, and then America is doing it at about the same time, creating department stores, and then eventually the shopping mall comes as the world interior of post-modernity. In a dyna, Minnesota, in 1956, with Victor Gruen's invention of the first bi-level interior enclosed air-conditioned shopping mall, <laughs> and that place is still there. It, it has survived. Uh, I looked it up not that long ago. The, the first shopping mall in 1956 is, is still there. Uh, amazing, but yeah, it's two different worlds. And um, Bakufin, this guy J.J. Bakufin in the 19th century, who was a um, teaching at about the same time as Nietzsche and all these guys were around um, and figured out this theory, what he calls mother rights. Um, but what he realized is that, and he had a huge reaction against uh, Theodore Mommsen's history of Rome, which he thought was shallow and looked at Roman battles strictly in terms of economics. And he said, no, 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 uh, the, the Romans against the Carthaginians are two different mentalities who have two different ideas. The Carthaginians are still worshiping goddesses. Right. Romans have moved on into this linear, rational, uh, patrilineal mentality. And if you look at almost every war that they fought with the Sabines, uh, not only the Carthaginians, but almost everyone they fought were goddess worshippers mm -hmm. uh, in almost every case. So for Bakovin, that's the real reason for these wars. The economic stuff is just surface effects, uh, you know, like you're saying, the, the external stuff. For Bakufin, it's the wars are fought for internal reasons, uh, just as I believe the, the world wars were, were fought for internal reasons, which is a perspective you don't see very often. It's, it's always about these clashes over territory. No, the Nazis wanted their land back. You know, no, there's other stuff going on underneath all of this, that the physical world is, a the physical world is always a manifestation of a deeper world, uh, a, a human psyche, a world out of which ideas are coming. 
So, so that's my, that's a really interesting question. I'm glad you asked that about that. It's too bad that the study of the collective interior and the study of the collective exterior are so balkanized in the contemporary academy. I've done a lot of research in social science, and I mean, at this point, cultural explanations or cultural approaches to studying countries or regions are not taken seriously. And all analysis is kind of materialist in some way or another. It's focusing on economic factors or geographic factors, inequality, very crude ethnic tensions, but never really exploring the ways that people in different countries think and feel and imagine and how that might affect their development. Part of the problem with that is that it's all politicized too. But, you know, it's, so it's really dangerous waters. It's like, I, if I have to be careful about every single word I say when I'm talking about another ethnicity, um, you don't really have any freedom to say anything then. Why bother? Yeah, and you know? it's, it's so ironic because like the analysts from the 19th century and early to mid 20th century who were pretty grand in scope and liked to talk about peoples all over the world, they actually had a lot more sympathy and empathy with people other than themselves. They really understood them better. They talked about them more openly. They noted differences between like the Africans and the Orientals. And now, as you say, any discussion along those lines is kind of radioactive. But the effect is really to obstruct thought about the yeah. interesting differences and the interesting different collective interiors that exist in the world. It's a regression masquerading as a program. Uh, it, it's worth pointing out that none of these guys, as I'm mentally reviewing them, uh, even the German ones, uh, supported colonialization. N none of them. There's not one of them that supported that. None of them were really that sympathetic with the Nazis. We have the example of Heidegger. Uh, who joined up with them for, for about a year before he realized he'd gotten into hot water, better better leave this alone. So he came to his senses. Um, Spangler was initially supportive of them also. I think everyone in Germany was initially supportive, supportive of them for economic reasons. You know, they came in and they put everyone to work. They fixed the disaster Great of the depression. Weimar Republic. You know, they, they fixed it. Um, kind of like what FDR was doing, you know, okay. working it out. And so they were initially supportive, but people did not know about the, the you know, the, the dark side of them with the camps and the, their intent with the final solution. They didn't know about those things. But Spangler uh, also initially supported them and then turned away from them when he realized what their racism amounted to. And he dismisses them publicly in one of his books, ironically, one that he signed and gave to Hitler. <laughs> but in that book, it's probably... It says the Nazis are a bunch of racist idiots. And here he is proudly handing it to Hitler. Uh, I'm sure Hitler didn't read it. Yeah, uh, he, knew, he knew Hitler wasn't going to read it. No, no. <laughs> Too busy fighting the war. So, um, But no, none of these guys. Uh, Carl Schmidt remained a Nazi, um, who was a great uh, thinker of the political, spec, political science, as we would call it, in the Anglo world. He's written some great books, and they're enormously, ironically influential on the left. Um, the Nomos of the Earth and uh, the... The, um, the concept of... Yeah, in political theology. Um, had a huge influence on Agamben, who was far left, and wrote, when he wrote Homo Saker, there's no way to understand Homo Saker without having to go back and study Schmidt, which is why I did it. And uh, so he would be like the worst case example of someone who was one of these guys but uh, remain a Nazi. Um, I don't know how he did it, but he seems a very, re as you're reading him, he's very reasonable and sensible. I'm not sure. Maybe it was just all about power. You know, people do have power complexes and they like to inflate their egos uh, by being, you know, res respect is, we should not forget what's called the Simonic Drive. And the Iliad is all about that. Uh, it should not be underestimated. Pe people do want power. Everyone wants it in yeah. some way. Yeah, and so it's a, it's a huge drive in deciding where people end up and what they do. Um, so maybe that was the case for Carl Schmidt. I'm not saying it is. I don't know that much about his personal biography, but I have heard people dismiss Spengler as a Nazi, and it's totally ridiculous. You know, he didn't have a racist bone in his body, uh, nor anti-Semitism, as far as I can tell. I, I you know, uh, so it's, it's totally ridiculous. It's, that's wrong. Um, but I think that thinking has infected the academy with these guys. Uh, but they make exceptions for Heidegger and Schmidt. Um, without Heidegger, you can kiss postmodern philosophy goodbye. It doesn't even exist. 
If Heidegger ceases to exist, there goes Derrida. If Nietzsche ceases to exist, there goes Foucault. But, you know, <laughs> I don't seem to realize here that French postmodern philosophy is about the influence of German philosophy on the French mind and its response. They're playing tennis, you know, back and forth. That, that's what it is. So you can't just dismiss these guys. Uh, I know there's a book called The Disinherited Mind. I think it's by Eric Heller uh, about the Germans after the war. Oh, we're disinheriting the Germans? You know what that amounts to? Let's, let's take Athens and Sparta. Let's say uh, the civil wars, uh, which were ridiculous and went on forever, uh, between Athens and Sparta. If you deleted Athens, you don't have Greek culture. It's not there anymore. It just vanishes. Yeah. Same thing with the Germans. You, delete, you disinherit the German mind. What's left <laughs> in Europe? And yeah, they produce the best architects, the best uh, philosophers, the best quantum physicists. The, you know, go down the list. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing left. So. What's crazy is they're also extremely mechanically good. Germany amazes me. It's the culture that impresses me more yep. than any other. I think so too. They're, they're the deepest, profoundest, most metaphysical, and they just show up. They, they always show up late, but when they do show up, they get it done. They get the job done better than anyone. Um, so you can't disinherit them just because of one tragedy. You know, people do go collectively insane. There is such a thing as a collective psychosis. You know, uh, we did it with the Native Americans over, over here. We're guilty of genocide, too. We've done the same exact thing. So this moral pointing doesn't work because every culture is guilty of atrocities. Even the Native Americans, if you study the history of Native Americans, all they're doing is trying to wipe each other out. That's all they're doing is committing genocide. Each tribe... Um, <laughs> so they were they're guilty of it too. Yeah, you know, I mean, no one is a victim. This, this idea, and this is part of the problem I have with the left now, is this victimhood mentality. No one is a victim. All cultures and races are guilty of atrocities. All of them. Yeah. One of the reasons why we pay so much attention to German atrocities is it's not because they were more atrocious. It's because their atrocities had more of an effect because of their power. Um, but yeah, because there again, they yeah. do everything better than everyone right, else. So. Exactly. If they're exactly. going to show up and do genocide, yeah. they're going to do it more systematically and efficiently than anyone else. You know, it's the exactly. German. <laughs> Unfortunately, in that case, uh, it's, you know. So the stages that different thinkers like Spingler, Toynbee, and Quigley talk about, the question is, are these stages, one, fixed in length, and two, unidirectional? Now, I think Spingler would kind of answer yes to both with some qualifications, but you know, he thinks the overall lifespan is about a thousand years. And he thinks you just, you go from spring to summer to fall to winter. And like, there's no going back. Whereas I think that with regard to the length of the stages and even the ability to like go backward, Wiggly and Toynbee might be a little different. Although I'm not positive. I just, I heard one person, I was watching a video about Quigley, and I think he said that Quigley thought that civilizations can actually go back to a previous stage or something like that. I don't think that the length of time matters to anyone but Spengler, as far as I know. Because um, with Quigley, you can always invent a new instrument of expansion that will bring about, you know, that will end an age of conflict. Um, Tony doesn't have a life cycle either, uh, but he does have those seven stages. There is always a, a genesis. There is always a fluorescence. There is always a time of troubles and a breakdown and a universal state. Case, you know, it's done. <laughs> Case closed with the building of the universal state. It might as well be almost a predetermined life cycle. Um, but yes, with Spengler, it matters. Although that thousand years, I think, should not be taken, it should be taken with a grain of salt, as mm. we've discussed last time. Um, like just thinking about the Egyptians, um, and he knows this, that the old kingdom itself is, is a thousand years. That's already uh, 3000 BC to 2000 BC, before they have all the civil wars with the first interregnum. That's already a thousand years right there, but it still has to go through the middle kingdom for another three centuries. Then it has to go through the new kingdom, which is its Roman imperial phase, which comes in 1500 BC. And finish that. So the thousand years thing is not something I, I think that he would hold too dogmatic. It's more of just a, a general vibe. Uh, the average person is going to live for, let's say, 80 years, um, maybe 100 at most. But So it just depends. The civilizations that reach the winter and then just stay there, the thousand years refers to the period of life, but then you can have this period of suspended decrepitude that can last a yeah, that, that can go on forever, theoretically, yeah. the, the suspended decrepitude. Yeah, absolutely. Right. 
Um, and it's, in theory, you wonder what, what happened to Egypt. Why did it die out? And in its case, the external thing that slammed into it were all these sea peoples, which mm. was just a total disaster. There, there was an endless human tide of sea peoples looking for land, just like the Vikings were, were kind of doing, and uh, troubling everyone. And it, it, it impacted Egypt at a point where its immune system had already been weakened on the interior plane by Akhenaten, by the pharaoh Akhenaten. And he had already weakened it in a similar way that Theodosius weakened the immune system of, of the classical world. Uh, and then so on the external stage now, once they get slammed by the sea peoples, they never really recovered from that. And they just become this sort of a museum of themselves. Yeah. The Greeks just regarded them as a dead museum. This was the people who was here before us, and they, they respected them. They paid them a lot of respect. But they were a dead museum to the Greeks, you know. Yeah. Uh, became a thing. Hey, let's go visit Egypt. Uh, Herodotus. I, I went to Egypt. I went to this, you know, like the way Americans think of Europe, let's say. Oh, I would love to go to Europe. That kind of thing. So these yeah. cultures do become dead museums. Um, and then, the, you know, with Theodosius anathematizing in 390 AD, all of the pagan cults, um, and that includes Egypt, then it can't be an accident that hieroglyphic writing disappears, you know, right after that. Uh, they stop writing in hieroglyphics. So, um, so they had all these external blows that hit late. When these blows hit, let's say when the Hexos invaded Egypt, when they're, when they're at the power of the Middle Kingdom, and they come in, and they do win, and they do conquer, uh, but only for about a century or so before the Egyptians rally and kick them out. Um, so it's a different scenario there when the culture is at its apogee. Um, yeah. Its immune system is capable of resisting these kinds of impacts. So now we can move to the comparative civilization portion. So, so far, what we've talked about in this conversation is, again, what all individual human civilizations have in common, what these thinkers have said about them. Then we move into this, like, really important pair of questions, which, again, involves comparing individual civilizations to each other. And you can do it either over time or across space. So we can note how civilizations have changed sequentially over time. A lot of our thinkers are fundamentally concerned with that, or at least largely concerned with it. We can also note how civilizations differ across space, that is, across geographical regions. And it might even be possible to like identify differences between civilizations which might exist across space or across time, although not necessarily sequentially. I don't know if Borkenau's death, transcending, accepting, denying framework would fit into that because it's kind of sequential. But in any case, I think the two big questions with comparative civilization are the chronological and a geographical question. I'll start with the geographical one. Obviously, this is really just to provide an overall framework that might be robust to all of these different thinkers and the different elements of their thinking. So let's like start with the, the geographical question. So how do civilizations differ across space, geographically or ethnoculturally, you might say? I think that of our thinkers, it seems to me that really only Spingler and Campbell go deep into that question, deeply examine differences across regions. Spingler with his different earth symbols, infinite space and Faustian yeah. civilization, or the body and classical civilization, which are very different. And that's one way in which he challenges the ancient medieval modern paradigm. That suggests that there's a single civilization when really they're different with different earth symbols. And then Campbell, obviously, with the masks of God, the primitive, oriental, occidental, creative. Would you agree that of these thinkers who you think are really indispensable, those are the two who most deeply examine geographical differences? Yeah, I think so. I think you're right about that because uh, Campbell obviously inherited it from Spengler. And Campbell then has this idea of what he calls mythogenetic zones. I don't know if we went into that, but... A little bit. Yeah, a mythogenetic zone is, 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 is a geographical area where a, a sudden uh, set of symbols appears that unites the population with the birth of a new myth. Um, this can often be the birth of a new religion. It can be Spengler's inceptual stage uh, at the beginnings of his civilizations. But wherever it is, it's a mythogenetic zone. And he says, for example, though, uh, how this differs with his inflection is that a mythogenetic zone can cover a very large region such as the Pacific, which he thinks is a mythogenetic zone, uh, sort of centered on the Polynesians in their world that has a set of symbols that are all in common. Um, and that links both the coast of North America with the coast of China. Um, so there are reasons why there are similarities between the Chinese and the Mesoamericans, the Olmecs, let's say, because they're part of the same mythogenetic zone. 
So there's these broader geographical uh, ideas. And then plus also, you're right to point this out about Campbell because the other really important thing about him, which I'm not sure we stressed, is his opposition to Young, even though he's a Jungian, Young says that all these archetypes are common and that uh, to the collective unconscious that we all share. And that explains why, you know, the virgin birth appears in Mesoamerica. And then the Spaniards get there and they go, oh, these people have a, the virgin birth myth. So, um, that's his explanation. But Campbell has this idea also that their cultures diffuse ideas geographically across space. And especially when you get two different cultures that are contiguous with, you, with each other, there, there's going to be a swapping of symbols. You're, you're going to find lots of common archetypes, motifs going back and forth between two societies. So diffusion is a big thing for Campbell. Um, that becomes like his main... Uh, explanatory thesis for why myths share things in common is because, you know, the cultures uh, trap the old Silk Road, he points out, was open from Cadiz, uh, Spain to Shanghai, China, from 100 BC to 180. And there was a massive interchange of ideas, Buddhist monks, uh, Christians, Christian monks going back and forth. There was a huge interchange of ideas there. Um, so that's an explanation that Young overlooked. Uh, Young's knowledge of history was respectable, but not that great, actually, to be honest. Uh, whereas Campbell is boots on the ground. He's, you know, he's American after all, very empirical, boots on the ground, uh, analyzing these trade routes, um, and then following where suddenly you get a methogenetic zone. Uh, so yeah, it's, that's important. Good that you pointed that out. Yeah, so, so it's interesting. I mean, because the thinker who drew me into this whole realm of thought was Spengler. But in a way, Spengler is quite different from the others and that maybe his most important contribution, other than obviously the notion that civilizations have a morphology, they are mortal, they are like organisms. Other than that, his greatest contribution is probably these really fascinating geographical differences and like yep. pinpointing the substantive core of any particular civilization. And, and I'm particularly struck or impressed by the classical body, Magian, Cavern, Faustian, Infinite Space. Yeah. If I may interject here uh, really okay. quick, the Magians in their landscape, uh, the Judeo-Christian Islamic civilization that comes out of the Palestinian region there, they have been burying their dead in caves in that region forever. Um, the cave was always essential. You find in the Old Testament where Abraham is going out and he buys a cave from the Hittites to bury himself in and his wife. Um, so this was a practice that went on forever. And then at some point when high civilization comes to this region, uh, it's perfectly appropriate that the, that the world is seen as a cave, a cavern, a, a Magian cavern. It comes right out of that land and that uh, age old uh, practice of burying the dead the earliest, some of the earliest burials on record, Shanidar, uh, 60,000 BC, we've got Neanderthals in that region burying their dead in caves. Um, so it goes back to forever. Uh, so it's really rooted in that landscape. Yeah. Um, with all of them. By the way, speaking of Neanderthals, I'm reading a book right now called The Inheritors by William Golding, the author of Lord of the Flies. Um, oh, yeah. Right. I never did read it, but I, I know what book you're talking about. Yeah. I, I'm, is it good? I had a little trouble getting into it, but now I'm completely hooked. Um, <laughs> right now, the Neanderthals have picked up an odd smell. <laughs> <laughs> we, we haven't seen the Homo sapiens yet. But. It's probably better reading than what I grew up on, reading Gene Owl's, you know, Clan of the Cave Bear stuff. I, I wanted to read something about the encounter between Cro-Magnon Man and, and the Neanderthals. It does a pretty good job for a, for a best-selling Walgreens book, let's say. Yeah. Uh, you, have, you have to factor that in, but she does a really, a really good job with the, uh, with the, the racism that existed between the two. They hated each other. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that the Cro-Magnons wiped out the Neanderthals through ethnic cleansing. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's the case. Centuries and centuries and centuries. Then the Cro-Magnons show up 40,000 BC, and by 27,000 BC, the Neanderthals are extinct. That's not an accident. <laughs> that's a cultural collision there. That, yeah. And, and right, and one side won, and one side's men impregnated a lot of the other side's women. Oh, yeah, there's we have Neanderthal genes. There's yep. a guy out here, Eric uh, Trickhouse, I think, out in the University of New Mexico, who points this out and maintains that, that we do have Neanderthal genes, and that plenty of raping went on. But that's a, I mean, of course, because that's a standard military. Yeah. You move into an area, and the symbol of conquering it is having those soldiers impregnate the, the local women. That's a symbol of the now we own you. You know, that's it's standard practice. So it's right. not a surprise at all. 
Um, no, I think I'm going to read Planet of the Cave Bear. The only reason I started with the Inheritors is that I thought no, it would be... And they're addictive. And you know, there's like, I think, six huge volumes. You won't be able to stop once you get going, let me tell you. Yeah. They're pretty good. So Spingler and Campbell have in common this interest in and articulation of regional differences. That's not a focus of the other thinkers. Like, they're more interested in sequential chronological change. So I just wanted to kind of note that the person who drew me in was Spingler, and I found particularly arresting his analyses, for lack of a better term, of these different regional civilizations. But... A lot of these other thinkers with whom I'm becoming familiar don't have that as their focus. They have more of the chronological variation. So let me move to them. So we've looked at what the nature of any individual human civilization is, what the common characteristics of individual human civilizations are. We've talked very briefly, really just in order to signpost it, that you can also talk about geographical differences. Now we're moving to chronological variation, chronological change. The first thing I want to mention here is, and this does not apply to any of your major thinkers, but one view of change over time is the progress model. I wouldn't go so far as to say that that's like the default view because a lot of people would dissent from that today, I think. But there are those, like I can point to individuals, very influential authors, for example, who basically subscribe to the progress model. The idea that we have graduated to individualism, science, capitalism, democracy, medicine, engineering, things are getting better. And Steven Pinker famously argued this, or has argued this in multiple books. The whole idea of ancient, medieval, modern, you know, that we've come out of the dark ages into the light and into the enlightenment. It's a kind of progress model. Modernization theory, which I talked about in a previous conversation, this notion that not only are all nation states subject to the inexorable forces of modernization, but that modernization is a good thing, as distinct from a sign of decay, which is something like more what Spengler would say. The notion that we've reached the end of history, whether it's Prussia in the late 19th century or the Western world in the late 20th century with Hegel and Fukuyama, this is one option. If you're thinking about how civilizations have changed over time, one answer is we have progressed. Things have gotten better. And the things that most people would point to in order to support this notion are like average life expectancy, maybe literacy levels, something like that. Okay, so anyway, I just wanted to put that on the table. Now, none of your thinkers is a proponent of a progress model, but many of them have sequential models. They're not progress models, right? So I can think of a lot of them. Coinbee, if you had to identify one really important thing that he offers to this conversation, it's the notion that there are three distinct generations of civilization, the strictly religious being the first, and then you get the philosophical mentality in the second, with the Upanishads and yoga, the Greeks and the Hebrews. But I don't think Toynbee is saying it's progress. No, that's what I was going to interject and say, uh, that the third generation uh, is the universal churches that come out with Mahayana Buddhism and uh, Islam and Christian, all the different species of Christianity. That's all third generation stuff, and it's he doesn't, he's careful not to say that it's a progress model. Um, I don't think he thinks of it that way. Yeah. Uh, but the one exception here, and there's a definite ex exception in the case of Aurobindo, which is somebody that I didn't factor into this discussion because I was much less familiar with him than I am now. I've, I've been reading him for the past few weeks um, just because of this connection that he has with the integral consciousness structure. In a, in a certain sense, I think Gebser rejects, he's read Spengler and he rejects Spengler's pessimism that all of this is just the decline of the West. Um, and he says, no, there's a new consciousness structure in here that comes in with modernity that has to do with a very sophisticated and difficult to understand integral consciousness structure that is capable of handling the, the previous structures at will, however it needs to, that um, is most directly exemplified in the highbrow world of physics art, uh, painting, you know, uh, that's where he you, you gives all the examples of poetry from uh, the world of modern art and modern culture, modernism, uh, as are his examples. Uh, but he does see it, I think he does see that the integral, you know, is optimistic and hopeful and new that Spangler missed with his yeah. pessimism. So you can contrast them that way. Whereas with Aurobindo now, whom Gebser refers to, so I went and did research on him, for purposes of these discussions. Um, for Aurobindo, it is a progress model, no matter how you say it, because he's got these four phases. We begin with matter, the world comes into being, we have matter, then we have life. Life comes into being out of matter, because uh, everything is a manifestation of pure consciousness um, from the other side. There are these spiritual dimensions for Aurobindo, uh, where spiritual beings live, and 
far as Aurobindo is concerned, the gods are actually real beings. Uh, they correspond to frequency vibrations on different planes of consciousness. So everything that comes into being on the physical plane is a manifestation already of a pre-existent consciousness that is concreting, let's say, manifesting itself physically. Uh, so then life comes out of matter, and then mind comes out of life via us, the Homo sapiens, and then there will be a supramental manifestation, which will be about, in a certain sense, the, the creation of the kingdom of God on earth, because uh, the supramental is the highest of his levels of consciousness, and it will materialize on the physical plane what everything started with, which is Brahman. He inherits the, the fundamental uh, Hindu idea that all is one, the single primordial energy Brahma, uh, Brahman. Uh, but Brahman is characterized forever. All the Hindus agree that it's characterized by three attributes, Sat, Chit, Ananda, being, consciousness, and above all, bliss. Ananda is bliss. So Aurobindo believes that the purpose and goal of our evolution here is to get back to that originary bliss and bring it down on stage here on the physical plane and that it is the task of the human species to do this. And uh, he recognizes that, you know, we're still very beholden to our animal nature, all the wars and, the, uh, you know, we're still very beholden to those, but that we will eventually overcome them and actually transform the species with this descent of the supramental. Mm -hmm. So this is a, it's interesting because this is a Hindu equivalent of the West's progress model. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he, in fact, I, just last night, uh, I was looking at a series of conversations between Aurobindo and his disciples, and one of the disciples asked him about Spengler. And of course, that pricked up my ears. He hadn't read Spengler, uh, but so the, the disciple synopsizes Spengler, and Aurobindo goes, so he doesn't believe in human progress at all? And the disciple goes, no, it just winds down. Every civilization does the same thing. Fascinating. He's like, well, that, that's, you know, for me, it's all about the, the realization of the supramental on the earthly plane. Uh, and it's too bad that he doesn't see that. The, the, it's, um, so it's interesting, these guys, and how they perceive where we're at historically. Yeah. Um, it's it's fun. I live yeah. for this shit. It's so much fun. <laughs> so, so kind of my general point here is that a lot of the thinkers are positing a kind of sequential model for understanding how civilizations have changed over time. Point has his three generations. You mentioned Aurobindo, who actually is kind of a proponent of a progress model. It's very yeah, interesting. Yeah. The question of Spengler was raised in his presence, and he made very clear that he found it interesting that Spengler did not believe in progress. That's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a yeah. very crucial thing to remark. Yeah. So obviously, Gebser, I mean, his central contribution is this description of the kind of collective interiors at different stages, the archaic to the magical to the mythical to the mythical. structures of consciousness. Yeah, yeah, that, right, structures of consciousness, those are sequential, those are chronological. It's interesting because he, he does see that not necessarily as a progress model, but as an awakening yeah. of species. So it, he almost leaves it to the reader to inflect it, which, which way you want to, is that progress? Uh, is the mental better than the mythical? Um, I'm not sure he would say that it is, uh, but it is an awakening. It is, it is an awakening. Yeah, right. A kind of unfolding or, yeah, because he certainly doesn't poo-poo like the archaic or the magical. He says they have reality, they are important. To repress no. them is regressive, probably. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They have their place, and that's the advantage that we have with the integral consciousness structure, is to see how each one has its place yeah. and can be used and activated at will. That's a fascinating idea because it is a pretty strong tendency in our culture to basically dismiss old consciousness. Dismiss these, uh, yeah. Because they seem to be in a progress model. Um, and with, okay, we should mention James Frazier here, the 19th century anthropologist who's similar to Gebser, who has three stages where he's got magic, which is followed by religion, which of course is the mythical, which is followed by science. Hmm. And his model is definitely a progress model because he sees that the scientific mentality anathematizes these others as superstitions. Um, so that's his model, his version of, his sort of equivalent to Gebser's model, which is definitely a progress model. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's yeah, and, and it's fascinating because a lot of, like, the wars between public intellectuals in America and in the West today, to some extent, have to do with this. Like, the new atheists taking on dissenters who are saying you're throwing out people don't even know how to describe it exactly like jordan peterson in some sense represents someone who's trying to like hold on to older consciousness he's reactionary yeah. yeah he's reactionary 
a psychological reactionary, <laughs> if there is such a thing. We may have just invented it. <laughs> so anyway, we've got Toynbee with his chronological stages. We've got Gebser with his, and it's sort of, his is, maybe we could say like closer to a progress model, but he's not that crude about it, and he kind of leaves it to the reader to decide. But he he does, you know, as you mentioned this, it, it always forces me to rethink these guys, because those three generations, Toynbee was very, um, he liked religion. He understood it, and he liked it. And I think that he saw the third generation as an improvement with, with these universal religions. Mm. Um, I think you could inflect it that way in his case, that, that, that it is an improvement over the previous two. Interesting. Um, I think so. I'd have to do more digging on that to come up with a final answer, but it okay. does feel kind of progressive to me. Toynbee has these stages, for lack of a better term. Gebser has these stages, structures of consciousness. I'm less familiar with Fraser, although I'm aware of the Golden Bow, but I didn't realize it was like magic, religion, science, and yeah, like, three stages. Is better. Right. That's interesting. Right. You've got obviously Campbell and the World Historical Atlas with the animal powers, seated Earth, celestial lights, way of man. I think Thompson. Which, by the way, oh, yeah. uh, I think Campbell would see that as as progress because um, he likes the way of man. He likes the idea of these axial age guys. You know. Uh, Yoshino Valkya or Lao Tzu uh, resisting the, the priesthoods of, of these big behemoths, you know, these old dying priesthoods. He likes this idea of the way of man, mm -hmm. and he thinks that it's on the way to the West, which I think was Campbell's favorite civilization. He, he mm -hmm. speaks about it uh, with a lot of pride, and um, which is one of the reasons why he's not read in, in the, the Academy, uh, because he is very west of centric let's say. Uh, he loves our civilization. And he loves this idea of, as we talked about before with Prometheus, the attitude of defiance against authorities, uh, because Campbell was all about, you know, he says that, you know, if you look at, this is an important point here, if you look at Spengler's model, um, the West seems to be the youngest, with the exception of Russia, seems to be the youngest of these civilizations. But Campbell says, actually, we're the oldest, because we start, art started here with the Paleolithic and shamanism. And shamanism is all about the individual vision quest. The shaman is his own authority. He doesn't defer to anyone else. And it's very different from a priest, where a priest is an authority figure who inherits a pre-fixed body of symbols dogmatically, which he is now the official representative of. But not the shaman. You have to deal with his craziness, with his psychoses. Like we were talking about the Eskimo guys, you know, who went to war against his... You, you never know what these guys are going to do. But that's Campbell. He loves that. Um, but he sees the West as glorifying that principle of the individual as a metaphysical species unto himself. Um, and the West has done that. Lorca now is in, in agreement with this too as well. Not in that paper, but elsewhere in that book. And so Campbell's model could be thought of as progressive. You know, it's um, fascinating because I, I started off by saying there's this progress idea but none of none of your <laughs> yeah, and now we're having to rethink all this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's really you have tough, tough questions, Brandon. These are probably some of the toughest I've ever had. Finishing up on the kind of chronological stuff. So, to some extent, Borkenau's death transcending, death accepting, death denying is chronological. Right? I mean, it's like yeah. Christianity yeah. goes back to death transcending, but the net gift is from right, death transcending to death accepting to death denying, where we are now. Yes, and he's consciously aware of Toynbee's three generations, and he's trying to plug this into it in that generational model. He's responding to Toynbee and saying, within these three generations, these are the attitudes toward death that right. Toynbee doesn't talk about. That they have different attitudes toward death, these three generations. And he's almost like a, it's, it's a regression. Or like, right? I mean, he thinks that death denying is not good, right? Right, that our civilization is, again, we're back to the decline. The Germanic, yeah. he was Austrian, but still uh, the yeah. Germanic decline model that, you know, we're in the Kali Yuga, the Iron Age, the worst. We're at the end of everything. <laughs> yeah. But it's funny because reading Aurobindo lately, he just totally rejects all of that. And um, it's really interesting to, to, to see these different points of view. Um, so it's important not to get stuck in any one of these guys. You, right. you're, what you're doing is really good and will be very helpful for people who see these videos. Uh, to not get stuck in a simple attitude toward modernity and what we're doing and what's going on. There are yeah. lots of different ways of inflecting yeah. it, both positive and negative. It just depends on what you want to look at. Right. Where do you want to stand in regard to this painting? You know, 
over here it's going to look different stand back it's going to look different you know that's what we're doing here yeah. with our situation right now on this earth thompson the riverine oceanic atlantic pacific is kind of chronological right even though it's also yeah. in a sense mm-hmm. geographical it is both uh, yeah that's right yeah First, it was riverine, you know, Indus Valley, Nile, Mesopotamia. Then it was the, Atlantic with the Greeks, the Mediterranean. Then it was the Atlantic. Yeah. Now it's going to be the Pacific. I'm not sure that's no, the, the Pacific for, for him. Yeah. But yeah, electronic technology in the Pacific and and the pollution there. By the way, we might have forgotten to mention this: that each one of these has a specific form of pollution. That the Pacific shift pollution is noise, electronic degradation, the, the electronic noise that decays the signal. Wow. So he takes into account the signal to noise ratio of electronic culture that has come out of the Pacific Basin, you know, with the Asians, as well as, uh, you know, Seattle, from Seattle all the way down to Silicon Valley. Um, so I think he's right about this, that, that we're in a Pacific shift right now, and that it started right after World War II with the aerospace industries coming out of the Southwest, which my grandfather was participated in. Uh, he was part of that whole world. And the reason why, one of the reasons anyway, why I was born in Phoenix, it was part, I'm part of, you know, mm. it's often had this thing where uh, both geography and ethnicity were very important. He thought of himself as Irish, even though he was born, born in Chicago, but raised in Los Angeles. Uh, so he came out of this Pacific ship too, uh, but still because of his descent, thinks of himself as Irish. Um, and he often does take thinkers and take regard for where they're at geographically and situates them. Um, this is one of the reasons why he hated Ken Wilber, because he's like, oh, Ken Wilber just comes out of this cultureless place. I forget where it was in the Midwest. He's in Colorado now, but from the Midwest, this cultureless place, um, he's part of that world. Whereas I think Thompson would characterize me as, as his, himself as part of this specific ship. So it's a different cultural ecology there. Um, there's another guy I'd like to talk about too, when we have time. The, the guy who wrote The Nine Nations of North America, with these different oh um, yeah um, what's his name i've read that um joel garo yeah right right or no i've re- i've read i've read a more recent version which probably I, I may not be nearly as good as the original but there's one called 13 nations um oh somebody expanded it then yeah, yeah he was kind of playing with this idea made famous by the person you just mentioned whose name i can't remember joel um, garo uh-huh. joel garo he taught actually out at asu when I was living there, I was tempted to go visit him, but I thought, nah, why bother? It'll just be a disappointment. <laughs> so I didn't go. But no, I like his thesis that there are these nine nations that have nothing to do with states. That right. do, with, in his case, economic zones, mm-hmm. uh, where he says like the, so the West Coast can be divided into Ecotopia, where all the, they have plenty of water, so they don't have the Southwest's anxiety over water. There's constant rain, but their values are far left, always on ecology, always focused on ecology. And I lived in Berkeley, so I know exactly what this mentality is like. It's so fucking annoying and self-righteous. Uh, but there it is. And then once you get to Los Angeles now, you're at the capital of Mex America, which extends across the entire Southwest and down into Mexico. So this is Mex America, where water shortage is a huge issue. So you get Cadillac Desert, uh, Mark Reisner's book about all the water scams that have gone on, you know, with William Mulholland in Los Angeles, all that stuff. And then it moves up above here. There's the great empty region of the north, uh, which overlaps from Alaska uh, and Canada down across Idaho, and where the um, let's see, the easternmost extremity is in Denver. Um, and there, the economy is all mining. It's based on mining of metals. Uh, so it's a miner's mentality here that ends with Denver as its borderline. And I can tell you when I lived in Boulder, he nailed this. There's two different worlds here. Mm. Like a, like a, the Midwest now is the farming world. So we have the Bible Belt farming world and the two meet together in Denver. Uh, and they did. Um, when I was living in a small town just 11 miles east of Boulder uh, called Erie, I felt like I was living in Nebraska. Uh, there were grain fields waving yeah. in the wind. I mean, it's, there's a definite divide there. But not only that, but at one point, uh, these uh, farmer guys who are conservative and they hate Boulder because of all the liberals there, they tried to secede. Secede? <laughs> and, and, yeah, to establish a northern Colorado from a southern Colorado. This was about eight or nine years ago. Mm-hmm. Needless to say, it wasn't a success, but it points to 
the fact that Garo has nailed it. <laughs> yeah. He's got this right. So then you move further east, and then down in the south we have Dixie, mm -hmm. which is obvious and doesn't even need to be discussed, the southern mentality. And then that ends uh, with Florida, and then the tip of Florida with Miami, and the islands is a new world. It's called the islands, uh, and its economy is based on drug running, uh, shipping wow. of cocaine, drug running, and it goes down into the island mentality. And then, so on the East Coast, then we have uh, New England uh -huh. on the one hand, and then we have uh, the, uh, the Rust Belt, the industrial world that ends with New York, the, the industrial world uh, of factories, which are now totally in decay and decline. And then we have New England, which is always stuck in poverty for the most part, uh, not much going on there. Even in terms of literacy, it's, it's nothing like it is uh, on the Lower East Coast with the, these worlds of the, both the South and what used to be called the North. But here, Garo, one of the great things that he does is he, he shifts you out of that North-South yeah, yeah. thinking to be sensitive to the fact that there are multiple zones here going on. And they produce different writers. They produce different sitcoms. Um, that exemplify the values of that region. Yeah, it's a brilliant and, little. Book. It's not that well written. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a lowbrow uh, intellectual book, but it, the insights are good. And in well, and, and, and certain places, two or three might come together. So I think the guy's name is Colin Woodard, who wrote Thirteen Nations. I, I haven't looked it up, but I think that's what his okay. name is. He slices it slightly differently, although there's a lot of overlap. So I think he defines regions more in ethnocultural and also geographical terms, some combinations. So for example, right, he has New England, which he calls Yankeedom, very Puritan influence. Yes. Um, you have the Deep South, which is, you know, large, forced black labor and a lot of people kind of coming out of the Caribbean slave economy. That's what the Deep South is. He actually calls Manhattan New Netherlands, even though it's small geographically. <laughs> He's, he says, was founded by the Dutch, right? And, 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 and his argument is still Manhattan represents a lot of what made the Netherlands distinctive in kind of early to mid-modern Europe. He actually <laughs> says that, oh, sorry, so the parts of Louisiana. Yeah, was, that's really interesting. So how, how is it that it's uh, the Netherlands? I mean, what, what about New York? Does he say that's... I think the idea of capitalism, cosmopolitanism. Outward okay. facing, very trade oriented, like that yeah. Manhattan has always been a very multi ethnic. Um, yes, yes, okay, all right. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. there's Appalachia, which goes from pretty far north down into Georgia. That's its own thing. There's New France and Louisiana. So Louisiana is interesting because it combines the Deep South and New France. Georgia has Deep South, a bit of Appalachia. I think North Carolina has Deep South, Appalachia, and what he calls Tidewater, which is kind of probably second son Cavaliers, the second and third sons of English gentry who come to Maryland and Virginia and parts of North Carolina in order to recreate English noble life. But, but yeah, I found it fascinating too, because- it's Really good. Uh, Sounds like he's sort of building off of Garo's model. Like yeah. he's aware of it. He's like, well, there are these other things too. Yeah, uh, right. I was going to mention one thing about, you mentioned the Caribbean and the overlap, yeah. where some of these cultures can overlap. And I have the feeling like the islands, which starts with Miami and goes through the Keys and is basically Caribbean, uh, and then New Orleans, which is deep south. But I think the two have penetrated there. Ah. The island world, because of voodoo, uh, voodoo comes out of the Caribbean. Um, it comes from the blacks, they've taken it from Africa, uh, and it's the magical consciousness structure, and it explains a lot about New Orleans and the way that it is that the uh, injection of voodoo and the magical consciousness structure into the Deep South in New Orleans is one of these special cases of uh, cultural overlap that I think yeah. explains somebody like Anne Rice coming out of that region writing all of her vampire novels, uh, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, yeah, so interesting about how these areas can can overlap and produce surprising semiotic hybrids you know yeah and new orleans may be like the best example of that actually like of yeah all. absolutely it's, it's totally um, so many horror films set in new, new orleans there's a ton of them yeah and even though it's like pretty small population wise it, it just has this place in our imagination that's quite large it does yeah I think that, you know, we, we've been talking now for almost two hours, and I had a lot of things related to the chronological and geographical differences that I wanted to bring You're up. We're going to have to then have another conversation. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, I think, yeah, I think maybe... I think maybe we should stop here 
we can just kind of pick up with, again, some questions related to both chronological and geographical differences. And then after that, I don't know what the next step is. It might be almost trying to come up with like a synthetic account that incorporates all these thinkers, although that's really ambitious. Or it might be to kind of take all of them and look at the current moment through every lens. But in any case, we can cross those bridges when we come to them. Okay. Wow. This has been a blast. This is yeah. really a, a, a fun. This is my idea of a great time right here. This yeah. <laughs> yeah no, me, me too. <laughs> and, and I think it's like. It's hard to find this, you know, out here in Santa Fe. I can't find anyone who can have sustained conversations like this. So yeah. uh, thank God for the internet. I know yeah, I was cursing it, it at the beginning, but <laughs> it definitely brings good things. Double edged sword. Yeah. All right. All right, Brandon, uh, until our next conversation. Take I'll, care. I'll email you soon. Okay, be well. Bye-bye.